Welcome to the 61st meeting of the, uh, the NISPAC. Uh, a couple of house cleaning things first, and then we'll, we'll get into, into straight into business. This is a public meeting. It's also audio recorded. We're also using WebEx, as we did at the last meeting for our phone participants. Uh, there are two microphones at the end of, of the, uh, the rows here, uh, and also at the first two rows. We're going to pass those uh, around, right, Greg? Yes. That in. We have those first two rows in the center are for the NISPAC members, those that aren't seated here. So I'd ask that any of you that are NISPAC members, if you're not seated in these first two rows, would you please? You're going to use the microphone especially. It's a little easier that way. Right. So um, you use the microphones that we're going to hand to you. Folks in the audience can use those two microphones on either side to ask, uh, ask questions. Most importantly, please remember to identify yourselves when you speak. As you know, we record these meetings and we also prepare a transcript of, of, of what was said. And it's critical that we know who said what because otherwise we have a chance of, of getting it wrong. So again, just uh, stand up and say, you know, I'm X from Y and that's, uh, that's sufficient for us to be able to uh, do that. We're going to let our speakers uh, present, and then uh, questions will be uh, more than welcome. So again, wait till the, the folks have actually finished their presentations. After addressing the questions, I'll ask uh, Mary Kay Gutierrez, our WebEx moderator, uh, if any questions were submitted uh, through the WebEx uh, chat form. So they'll be actually you know, last few, and then we'll ask uh, folks on the phone. Um, if there are, Carolyn McClink and my staff will read the questions uh, so we can all, all hear them. So, presenters, uh, other than those here at the table who don't have slides, uh, must use the podium uh, at the front of the theater to speak. Robert Tringali and my staff will assist those uh, who have a presentation on the screen. Presenters will also have access to a remote where they can move the slides at their own uh, pace. We'll have a 10 minute break uh, during the middle of the meeting. Uh, the location of the restrooms when you exit the theater, they will be on the left side once you uh, enter the hallway, as is the Nara Cafe. If you have it, let us know. Now, I'd like to uh, welcome our newest NISPAC members and express our appreciation to our outgoing members. First, I'd like to welcome Jeffrey Spinninger, who will serve as a representative for the Department of Defense. He has replaced Heather McMahon, and we look uh, forward to his contribution. I've, had a chance to actually work with Jeff. Very pleased with his uh, directness, his openness, and his uh, good sense of humor. So, colleague and as a, uh, a real asset to us. Well, thank you. No. Um, <clears throat> we'd also like to welcome uh, Elizabeth O'Kane, who will serve as a representative from the Department of Army. Elizabeth's on the phone. Is this, is this? Oh, there we go. Okay, I, I've been told bad, bad information. Anyway, welcome, Elizabeth. Excited to, to add you, too. An outgoing member is David Lowy from the Air Force. After 28 years of civil service, David will begin a new career in industry. So you'll be sitting on the other side, I guess. We're grateful for your service and uh, wish you well. Um, I understand that this time has not been a replacement. And Sharon uh, Dollinger has, has been serving very ably as the uh, Air Force alternative. Alternate. Finally, we'd like to recognize. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> Finally, we'd like to recognize Allegra Woodward, uh, Woodard from, from ISU, who provided valuable service to both ISU and the NISPAC. Uh, Allegra was very involved with the NISPAC and uh, the NISP program. She's an expert in her field, and she'll be retiring and leaving us in uh, in June. So, if you know of anybody who's a really good information specialist who'd like to apply to ISU, please do. Uh, and a wonderful asset to us. We'd also like to uh, recognize Brian Mackey as the new industry uh, rep. Brian, is he here? Yeah, he's here. Welcome, Brian. We're looking forward to having you uh, working with us. You'll find this uh, a collegial group, but uh, you know, one that's intent on getting some things done. So anyway, welcome. Uh, we're going to do introductions a bit differently this time. We're going to try to really cut them down uh, to save some time. Um, so I'm going to ask those of you here at the table to introduce yourselves uh, uh, along with your affiliations, and then we'll move to the first two rows of the NISPAC. I'm Mark Bradley, Director of ISU and the uh, Chair of the NISPAC. Um, Jeff Spinninger from DOD. Greg Pannoni, the designated federal official for the meeting and ISU. 
demography industry. Quentin Wilkes, Miss Texas President. Valerie Kerbin, DNI. Dennis Keith, Industry. Of the NISPAC members. Why don't we start over there? Bob Harney, NISPAC. George Ladner, CIA. David Lowy, Air Force. Kim Bogger, State Department. Mike Scott, DHS. Dennis Ariaga, Industry, NISPAC. Gerald Stone, Industry, NISPAC. Kim Tiger, NSA. Dennis Brady, NRC. Amy Roundtree, NRC. Elizabeth O'Kane, Army. Zadaya Taylor Dunn, NASA. Go ahead and introduce yourself, Mark. Get, could someone give Mark a microphone, please? We know we'd like to have more microphones, by the way, but this is what we're told is all that's available in the National Archives. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Mark Brooks, U.S. Department of Energy. You're going to have to hold it, Mark. Oh. <laughs> that's, that's part of the deal. Are there any members of the NISPAC itself who are on the telephone who need to be introduced? At this time, I do not see anyone from the list that was sent to me on the telephone. Okay. Hey, excuse me. Robert, could you have someone close that door? Thank you. All right, before we, uh, we start, I'd like to address an issue that I raised uh, last time. As I said, I've been here now for two and a half years, and I, I must say, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I being listening to the, the NISPAC, my goal is to actually make it into a body that not only uh, hears concerns, but actually does something about them. I've got to tell you, you know, reading the minutes of the past NISPAC meeting reminds me of being back in the CIA and reading Castro's speeches on the uh, Cuban economy. Always the same. Uh, the guavas are good, coconuts not so much, bananas are moving, sugar canes. Uh, bottoming out. It's the same stuff over and over again. And it's good that, that we're all familiar with the issues. The problem is there's no answer to them. And that's not, not good. I mean, and this fact to me should be a much more important body than it's, uh, it's been in the past. And so uh, with that in, in mind, this morning I was reading the Wall Street Journal, and there was a, a shocking article on the front page. Anybody read the Wall Street Journal this morning? The article's headline, uh, Chinese hackers attack the U.S. Navy, reports this. And it's a 56, talks about a 56 page unclassified report that the Navy just released that talks about uh, how much uh, national security information steal from us, and especially from its contractors and its subcontractors. And the report excoriates the Navy for not sharing more information with contractors and subcontractors. And the report concludes that. What's been taken probably has altered the geopolitical state of the uh, South Pacific. If we were to go to war with the Chinese today, we could well, well lose. Information sharing is critical. If you remember before 9-11, the government uh, was, didn't do a very good job sharing information among itself. After 9-11, and again, you know, the loss of, of you know, a few thousand American lives, we finally began to concentrate on getting that right. I think the next crisis, is not sharing enough with industry. We've got to do a better job about information sharing to keep this country safe. Things like this happen because of, of people not being told what the threat is or, or, or how long, you know, how, how deep it is or exactly what, what our adversaries are after. It exposes us in a way that we may not be able to. It's devastating. So I would beseech you uh, to then we need to realize we're a partnership. We are, we are together in this. The industry and, and the government, in my view, many times are the same. And I, I know that there's some things the government wants to, to keep uh, to itself, and, you know, quite frankly, it has the right to. 
What I want to do in this committee, though, is to be able to explain why that's so or, or to at least give you some idea of, of, of the government's uh, thinking, be more transparent. Um, I have one big sword that I wield, and that's I uh, write an annual report to the President of the United States. Last year's was actually read for the first time in many years. The reason is we totally changed the format of it. I made it much more like a CIA analytical assessment with judgments, uh, key judgments, findings, trying to make it more forward-leaning, i.e., to get the damn thing read. And so, uh, lo and behold, John Bolton, National Security Advisor, actually read it. So what I want to do this year, and again, the government shutdown has uh, hampered me a bit in, in terms of collecting data and that. But what I want to do this year is I want to start highlighting more of the National Industrial Security Program and some of the, the problems that I see in it and, and things that need to be fixed. And among those, again, is information sharing. I might this year, I haven't decided, you know, to talk about uh, the NID process a bit and, and say, look, you know, we're making great, great strides in security clearances and sharing and reciprocity but we're not doing such a good job on this. Why is that? Again, to elevate some of these issues up to the leaders of this country. I just want some answers. Uh, and, and again, we may not like the answers we get, but that's okay. I mean, the, the main thing is, is to ask the questions. So again, uh, Greg's gonna amplify this more as, as, as we get into his, his part of this. Some of the issues that are still outstanding that, that we need answers on. And again, I know this is, is, is uh, sometimes to be a cumbersome but it's got to be worked because we cannot afford to have things like this happening. We just can't do it. I mean, it, it devastates our, our national security, and it's not acceptable. So for that, I'll turn it over to you, uh, Greg, to talk about past, uh, past yeah. business. So thank you. Um, we, just a few admin things that we have to cover. Uh, the presentations and the handouts were sent electronically to all the members and those who provided an RSVP uh, to our invitation, um, and also for those attendees who didn't receive these documents, uh, we will make them available, included with final minutes of this meeting and the official transcript that we also provide. Um, apologize, there was a delay in getting the minutes out from our last meeting, but we did have a 35-day partial government shutdown that greatly impacted ISU and other parts of the government. Um, and you may already know, but the NISPAC meeting announcements are posted in the Federal Register approximately 30 days prior to these meetings, because these are public meetings open to everyone. So unless there's a question or questions on that, I'm gonna, going to move into some of our, well, all of our follow-up action items from the last meeting. Okay. So at our November 15th meeting, the items that were taken as things that we need to uh, go back and get answers to uh, were that uh, Charlie Phelan from MBIB would speak with Lindy Kaiser from Clearance Jobs about security clearance numbers. There was some discussion about discrepancy. Um, my staff has reached out to MBIB and Clearance Jobs, and as far as we know, the action is still open. And is there anything you want to say about it? Uh, okay, we'll, we'll wait. That's fine. Thank you. Thanks, um, the, the next, there's three items um, that were for DOD, and Valerie Howe um, will address those. Um, we can either do it now or we can do it. Uh, why don't we do it now? And they are, let me, let me just state. Uh, the first was to provide feedback as to how DOD critical technical technological protection, the, the DOD critical technology, can't speak this morning, technology protection task force will interact with industry. Uh, so if you want to go ahead and update the group now on that, that that's fine. Uh, can you hear uh, on that item, um, the task force uh, is participating in the meetings that the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment has periodically with various industry CEOs. May I go on to the next? Yeah, so the other two, uh, they, they interrelate. They have to do with the DFARS clause, um, one concerning cyber threats, which is uh, the perennial issue we hear about all the time, um, and the other one also related to DFARS, and let's see, uh, 
had to do with industry wanted to know if there was a way for them to be consulted on with the requirements that may come about on that. So um, the, the DFARS requirements. So go and, ahead. Sure. and some follow-up with the two industry uh, representatives who raised those questions. For the DFARS, it's the DFARS clause that provides the requirement for compliance with NIST 800-171, and there were questions about how oversight would work because there had been some individual DOD components who provided specific guidance on their contract. Department of Defense has now formally established a process for DCMA, oversight of contractor compliance with the DFARS clause for 800-171 for those contracts for which DCMA has contract oversight um, I will provide ISU a website where that guidance is listed, publicly available, um, for, for members to review. Um, in the context of cyber threats, it was my understanding from the discussion um, that I had last week with uh, the industry representatives who raised the question that that question was in relation to the oversight and compliance with NIST 800-171. Does anyone have any questions on those items at this time? Oh, yeah, we're going to need, unfortunately, uh, you're going to have to move towards the aisle, unless you can speak. Okay, and state your name, Jane, please. Jane <laughs> Okay. I've gotten a text that someone is... Uh, yeah, we need our technical support to please on... They're supposed to be on mute unless they're speaking, so they should be able to. Oh, okay, I see. Tech support, did you hear that? Can you repeat that, please? Can you repeat that, please? I, I'm sorry. Somebody was calling in and they and it's on mute. They can't unmute it. Oh. We, we apparently are on mute, so they can't hear it. Supposedly. So no, the, the audio, here. I'm sorry, sir, the audio for your participants is coming to just clear because I'm also logged in as a participant and listening as well on that line. Your participants cannot unmute their own lines. Did you need them to be able to do that? Right, yeah, they, they can't. So if they wanted to ask a question, we have to. We, we if, have they, to if they want to make a comment or a question, they can uh, press pound two, the pound sign and the number two on their telephone keypad, which would indicate they'd like to ask a question or make a comment, and then I can unmute their line for them. Oh, we do have someone who just raised their hand. I'm going to unmute her line. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi. This is Wendy Kaiser with Clearance. I say that there were a bunch of us that were on the Google Hangout dial-in and um, didn't have our individual participant code. I know there were probably about ten people on there. So I don't, and I didn't actually receive an individual participant code, so I had to steal Caroline. Um, so my guess is those people were dialing in using the, the Google Hangout, and they cannot hear you, nor can they participate because they're actually on the wrong call. So I don't know if there is a way to open up and join the Google call invite that you sent for the meeting to this meeting, or if you can resend out to the participants um, a, a general code that they can all dial into, but there were a bunch of people that could not get dialed in. Thank you. Uh, Robert, just so you know, if you'd like to send information, the, the, the call-in information to whomever you invited, I can give you that information to do so. Uh, the way that this event was set up is a pre-registration event, so they were sent an invitation that they would have to fill out and then get a specific attendee ID that they would put in when they called into the number. But I can give you just the regular number and the, and the regular send access email. code. Mary Kay, can yep. you send that to my email? Absolutely. Okay. And, and may I uh, provide one more update? Sure. Um, there were discussion at the last public NISPAC meeting about NISPOM change three, the status for C3 implementation. DOD is continuing to assess um, how to implement that. We did provide a draft ISL some time ago and received NISPAC feedback. We are continuing to do the assessment, particularly for industry and the concept.
of how the pre-approval process would work as DOD is also working to determine how it is going to implement C3. We can provide another update at the next NISPAC meeting. Any comments? I'll just interject on this one. I, and I, I know I have the director's support. This is one of those things where um, I have to say, C3, I think, was published June of 2017, if I'm not mistaken. So, you know, here we are two, almost two years later, and we're not there. I'm not throwing stones at anyone, but we really need to take a, a better look at how we, we do this because it's, it's really not acceptable in a case like this where the rest of the government, and, and you know both programs are supposed to operate in, in tandem, more or less. We have language in the executive order that, that speaks to that. Um, so, so we really need, you know, my understanding was conforming changes were meant to address things rapidly or, or relatively rapidly. I don't, I don't see close to two years as meeting that objective. So um, we did briefly, I, I recall I said something at either our clearance working group on this or in our uh, resolution meeting. Um, you know, if, if, it, if there's a way that ISU can help um, put something out to all the CSAs, uh, we're, we're certainly open to doing that. Um, but, but I really think we need to take a look at that process uh, of how we and changes more quickly. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Greg, thanks. Um, that's true. Um, but I would say we're sort of stuck in a place where we can get it right or we could get it fast. Um, for the industry folks here, we certainly aren't going to try to push anything into industry until we can figure out how we're going to do it inside the department. Uh, and we haven't made a lot of headway there either. Um, and uh, so, so our, it, it is becoming a higher priority. Um, and what I would ask um, you all to do is to, to, to ask to this. Uh, your clock is is kind of a long one, but there's a lot in there, uh, and some of it um, was pretty easy to write down, um, but some of it's harder to think about how we would implement. Uh, Pre-approval to, uh, to the one example that Valley put out there is uh, uh, very challenging, uh, and it's challenging inside government. I can only imagine what will be when it's time for us to take it to industry. Any comments on that? Any, any observations? Okay, ready to move on? Um, we, um, the, the next thing now was the, uh, the meeting that, that was uh, uh, spurred on by the chair's comments um, with some of these issues that we hear about um, on a regular basis but don't seem to resolve. So uh, we, we did start that. We, uh, the action is still ongoing. We had our meeting on February 12th, the, again, the partial government shutdown uh, did set us back a bit. Um, we asked industry uh, to prepare their list of top 10 issues or problem areas, and that's how we framed it as, as problems. So we came together, um, we did a spreadsheet to, to further specify and be more granular as to what the problems were. The first move was to get everyone involved. All the CSAs were invited, plus DSS, um, to agree that these, in fact, were problems and why they're problems. So what's the impact? If it's a problem, there has to be a, a problem impact. And so I, I believe there was, at least in the room, agreement on that for these items. Uh, the items uh, were not, we weren't able to completely get through them on the 12th. Uh, we used part of the clearance working group meeting on um, the 28th of February to pick up on those. Um, that spreadsheet that I mentioned uh, was meant for each of the participants to go back to their agencies and uh, based on the discussion and the steps ahead that were recommended in the, to see if the senior agency leadership uh, would agree to those things. So we had recommendations from both industry government and ISU on these items. The items themselves were, uh, topically speaking, were the seeds. Uh, there were, these were, there were layered, there were, there were sub-issues within the problem area. Uh, reciprocity, DSS and transition, 
Transition Trusted Workforce 2.0, uh, Defense Information System for Security, the consultant white paper. Um, so I'm just giving you the topical right now. We'll hear more later, I believe, in this meeting. Uh, deliver Uncompromised, um, Industry Selection for Advisory Committees, um, Advisory Committee on Industrial Security and Industrial Base, and Meeting Timelines for Industry Concerns. And then subsequent to that initial meeting, uh, accountability for top secret was added to the list. That was also a discussion at the NISA uh, working group meeting on information systems. So uh, as I said, we prepared the spreadsheet uh, on each of these areas so that we could more easily identify, comment on, and ultimately resolve. That's, we, we, gotta, we, have to, you know, we have to be more about action oriented uh, to echo chair said. Um, so we, I think we had some good discussion. Uh, one positive outcome was that the ODNI is going to host a meeting, including those same participants, um, up to 12 industry people actually, uh, to discuss, among other things, industry's inclusion in the development of Trusted Workforce 2.0 vetting efforts, and more broadly, NIST-related policy development, at least within the lanes of the ODNI. So that meeting, uh, which is our next action item, where we asked for that at the last meeting, uh, is scheduled for March the 28th, hosted by uh, ODI, CSC, Bill Evanina. So I uh, hope that that will generate more discussion in terms of development, uh, leveraging collaboratively the expertise of both industry and government. So uh, let's see, ne moving on to the next item. And if you want to ask questions now, we can, or we can just hold until we get into other parts of the meeting. Um, the next item, I'm almost done, was the uh, possibility of, of extending an observer role to non-federal entities on the CUI Advisory Council. And so uh, Mark Riddle of our staff will brief an update on the CUI program in general. But the next uh, CUI Advisory Council meeting is scheduled in two weeks. That is an item that's on discussion. Um, really, we did have one meeting prior to the shutdown, but we weren't able to tackle this issue. So um, I'm confident we'll, we'll get to a place with those government members where industry can at least be there as an observer. So stay tuned for that one. And last item, um, we have finalized the dates for the next NISPAC meetings. So you might want to take note for your calendars, July 18th and then November 20th. And we'll be meeting in this, this theater again. So that's all I have on that. Any questions? Once again, ladies and gentlemen on the phone, if you'd like to ask a question, please press pound two on your telephone keypad to enter the question queue. Okay, hearing none. Our first is the inimitable Charlie Phelan, who will talk about the uh, embed. Charlie, please come up. <coughs> I'm sure which adjective you just used, but... Uh, Thank you. Um, the, and this is better than last time. I said the, the, the spotlight and the interrogation lights aren't quite as bad as, uh, as they had been. And uh, good to see Jeff up here. And I think uh, to your point, Mark, that uh, somebody who has um, uh, sort of uh, is direct, is open, and has a sense of humor are three good attributes to have in this business. So welcome aboard. A um, couple, couple things. I really had three, three topics quickly to cover. Now they only gave me 10 minutes, and I hope to take only about 30. The, uh, um, <laughs> So first thing, uh, the question, the, 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 usually the first question is what's the inventory? The first question I get today when I walk into a room is, so where's that executive order? Uh, I think the last two times I've been here, I've uh, promised it's, in, it's uh, right on the cusp of being issued uh, to move uh, the NBIB operation to the Department of Defense in its entirety. Um, that is still just about to happen. Um, I can attest to the fact that I saw a live version of the latest draft, and it is, uh, we're down to a couple of us. And uh, I think it'll be ready for for, uh, for signature soon. But it's uh, I think the drama part is all pretty much gone, and now it is uh, signature on it. All that said, um, 
uh, we and NBIB and the other we, which is DOD and represented several of the front row here, um, have not been waiting for this executive order. We've been working very, very hard for the last many, many months uh, on pretty much all fronts to get things ready to go. And if the flag gets dropped, uh, we can start moving, moving out. So I think uh, 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 we're in pretty good shape on that. I think uh, in the end, you, we will end up with, with this new organization, um, the biggest security organization in the federal government, perhaps even in the world, depending on how you figure this thing out. Um, and, uh, it, and not just for the Department of Defense, but covering the investigative work for 105 federal agencies that we cover today. And, uh, um, and that includes a lot of you side. And so this is, the, you have a huge stake in how well this thing works. And at times it's a little bit scary because you think about the magnitude of this thing, but our, our combined commitment here is that this will happen without any speed bumps that you can see. And that when you wake up on October 2nd, notionally, of, uh, of uh, this coming, it'll look just like uh, September 30th. So stay tuned. We'll see where that goes. Uh, second thing is we, I'm a, am I in charge of slides or is somebody flying these things here? So um, which way am I going? I'm sorry, I didn't get the, uh, I also don't fly max nines or max eights anyway. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Okay. So forward is that yeah. one. Okay, so, okay, so now that I know where it is here. I want to uh, so talk about where inventory stuff is here. I did promise you uh, over the last two meetings between myself and Mark Scarco was here, I think, for the last one, and, and uh, talked about some of this, that uh, by the end of the year, our inventory would be down um, by, uh, by 15 to 20 percent. Um, we made it, and we've continued from there. Uh, our inventory today is um, 542,000 in the inventory down from its high point of last April of 725, about a 25% drop. And we're continuing to drop. Uh, and I think uh, you're going to, you're, you're, we've made it, we're going to steadily decline here, and um, I think it's important here. I do want to give you some, some numbers on, uh, and that's timeliness, I don't like time. Um, <laughs> we're getting it. So, and I, and I um, actually, let me go back here for a minute as I think about this. Uh, Mark referred to old Cuban reports and coconuts and pineapples and bars or bar charts or something. These start to take on that aura. Yeah. I'm going to show you something here in a couple of minutes that uh, I think is uh, So we're going to bypass that real quick and we're going to talk really about inventory. And what I want to do is break down within that whole total number of 542,000, um, what are the, the numbers that mean most to industry right here? Um, I'm going to take a guess. It's tier three initials and tier five initial investigations, and how quickly we're able to get those done, and what those numbers look like. So, of the in our entire um, inventory of 100, and, I'm sorry, 542,000, there are 176,000 tier three initial investigations we have active right now. 37,000 of which are industry. Uh, on the tier five side, we have about 80,000 uh, active. Tier 5 investigations, about 25,000 of those are industry investigations. Our industry total peaked at about 127,000 last June, a little bit lagging delay from what the other high point was. We're currently down to about 96,000 for industry, about a 24% drop. Matches what we've done overall in, in our stuff here. Um, I would note um, that that total number we have, not, I can't really break this down for industry because I don't have that, that good access to data, uh, but for the, the total of the um, uh, 256,000 initial national security investigations we have in the inventory, uh, about 103,000 of those are current, those people are currently at work operating on an interim access. And it's about 40 to 45 percent in each category. So that's not, not a bad number. Still, those are people that are working, they're productive. But it still is, a, is a leaves them 60 percent or not at work, and they need to finish all that stuff up. The, um, you'll also notice some of the ebb and flow of cases we have coming in in industry. You'll notice August and September there's a spike upward on the uh, initial cases coming in, tier threes and tier fives. Um, that's not unusual. We get that every year. A little interestingly is that apparently not everybody was off work in January of this year. You'll notice a spike on incoming cases in January. Um, particularly over on the side. So some people were not asleep. Uh, so getting down to timeliness here, I do um, want to go to another way of looking at this thing. Rather than charts that show I 90% in this many days and everything, I really want to show you where the 
the ebb and flow of this stuff goes. And this is um, sort of a new way we thought about looking at it. We're including this in our key performance indicators that we send out to all of our, uh, our government customers uh, on, a, on a weekly basis here. But what, what this shows is January of last year versus January of this year in terms of, of where cases are, how old were they at the time we closed them. And so, for example, uh, the, the uh, top line is the Tier 3 uh, initials. Um, what you see in the bar is the, the, the colored bar, the blue in this case, represents the middle 50%. So a 25% to the left, 25% to the right. Uh, and you can see uh, what the median day, days uh, uh, of age of that case is when we closed it. Uh, 184 days old when we closed them in Jan as a median age in Jan January 18, down to 150 days today. And you can also see from the very left end of the, of the, of the narrow bar, uh, we're actually closing some, if you do sort of a rough measurement, measured in single, single low double-digit days in, in several of these cases. Um, and you'll, you'll see that down there. I'll, I'll talk a minute about the Tier 3 reinvestigations in just a minute. That's a little bit of an anomaly here. But and what you can't see, actually the, the lower chart sort of cuts it off. But you, again, you can see the, uh, on the Tier 5 uh, initials, um, the sort of brown-colored ones, I guess they are here. That, that median age has dropped from 510 down to 396, and you can see a lot of stuff that is closing a lot earlier in this. It's showing a lot of progress in terms of the bulk of the cases getting closed faster than we were in the past. You will see out on the right-hand side sort of a hash mark. That's the 90% mark. There's a lot of stuff that sits out there because there's some stuff we just have to be collected before we can close the case. A lot of it has to do with prior, prior, I'm sorry, prior employments. but. Uh, um, I think what this, this chart shows us, except for that uh, reinvestigation piece, how that, that number is moving more to the left than where we really want it to be. Not where we totally want it to be at this point, but making some good progress. The tier three reinvestigation piece really uh, is an, an anomaly in the sense of some of the stuff was, was sitting there waiting for, um, for some changes in the uh, uh, executive orders and an executive correspondence. And then by the time, by when we started clearing out a lot of that stuff, which was after January 2018, we were able to close an awful lot of cases that were old and seeing a lot of cases that look a lot older, lower in that. But we don't count the cases as, as in, the, in the averages until they're actually closed. So uh, you can take in that, you can digest that a little bit, but that's uh, sort of where we are on that sort of stuff. Last piece here, um, well, before I get to core the last piece, sort of what, what has really allowed us to get that far? Um, Reiterating what I probably said the last two or three times, field work is the longest pole in the tent on all these cases, and that's what has uh, taken the most time. Um, we have our investigative um, uh, capability or capacity is, uh, has been up at about 8,800 for the last many months, and, and as that, that uh, stays steady uh, and as it gets more mature, we're output um, equally as important, maybe more important, better using those investigative assets talked in previous meetings about hubs and, uh, and, and putting things together geographically, both for government customers and for industry. And uh, we're mo moving more and more in that direction. Where we do that, we see some significant changes. Uh, a couple of us in the room were out in, uh, at uh, uh, Pacific Command last week looking at what we had done in that entire theater for both um, uh, government and contract activities out there. And uh, the investigative inventory in many dropped by 40% just in the last many months because of the level of effort in those kinds of actions. So we're seeing some really good results on that. Um, and uh, um, the uh, last piece I really want to talk about today is um, just a couple seconds on Trusted Workforce 2.0. I see that, uh, Mark, there is a meeting set up at the end of this month for, for industry to, to get a little more detail on it. That's good. There's a lot of stuff out on the, in the in blog sites and uh, news reports talking about this. And um, so you can always log into some of those things. But uh, I would just say that a couple of things. One is it is an ODNI and OPM-led uh, approach to uh, re-looking re at what it means to be a trust, both the investigative guidelines, what are the adjudicative guidelines, and I would argue probably got to look at the adjudicative guidelines first and then build the investigations to meet those guidelines. Uh, and, uh, uh, it's really come in two phases. The level of effort one is really focused on what can we do quickly to help make have an impact on our inventory and getting cases closed faster. Uh, we had a series of executive correspondences. The most effective one was probably the one issued last June, which has had a, a good effect on our ability to close some cases faster and has contributed to some of these numbers here. Uh, the, the big leap here is the level of effort two, which is to really go back and baseline all of those adjudicated and 
Um, that's well underway. Uh, you'll hear more about that. Your representatives will um, uh, later this month. You do, on the executive steering group, do have two representatives from industry in the uh, group, and they're active in the executive steering committee on this. Um, and uh, um, I, again, I would say, oh, oh, and then we get down to the nitty gritty of who is who is working on what are these policies and, and, and uh, uh, changes look like. We have not just policy makers in the room, but people who actually do this stuff for a living, sitting in the room and helping people understand mean when you do this. What does it excuse me mean when you do that with an investigation or make an adjudication? And it, it will be pretty well informed. Um, I would sort of argue this is sort of a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and I mean it almost literally since the last time we really had a major change, and this was probably when Truman was president. Uh, the, uh, but this, this is an exciting time to be sort of in this business, and I and, uh, hope to get you guys more and more engaged and involved in all of this stuff. Um, the last thing I did need to go back and address the one item that was outstanding from last week, which is uh, a conversation with Lindy. I know uh, Lindy's on the phone because I think she asked a question a minute ago, but uh, some folks from uh, the NBIV um, um, liaison activity had some conversations with her this week and I think previously as well. I think that re recapping the challenge on that was that we had published the Secret Act, um, uh, actually, and our, the first and second one we put out, um, following the maxim that you lawyers will understand is you don't answer a question you weren't asked and you try to answer the question you were asked. We did that. The problem is the questions we were asked by the uh, legislation, when we answered them, uh, didn't really put things into the context that we needed to. And we did not do a very good job of, of saying what this really means in the, in the report. So, so a number of people looked at it and drew some interesting conclusions that weren't really what to say in this report. So uh, more specifically, we've, been, we've talked to Lindsay a few times on this, and I think she is okay. I'll leave it to her to say if she's still good with the numbers on this. But uh, um, I think we've, we've closed that loop on that. But more importantly, um, we're going to the next version of the Secret Act that comes out will have a much better array of how those numbers look. We'll answer those questions, and then we will tell them what we really meant by those numbers, and we'll go from there. So that's all my sort of prepared remarks here. That's sort of what today's like, what tomorrow's going to be like, and so I'm open for any questions. One in the front here. Oh, okay, never mind. Sorry, Kim Bogger, State Department. Everything apparently. I just had a quick question. When you mentioned about the um, executive order, and you said on September 30th everything will be the same on October 2nd. Um, it, I'm asking just because it seems like we always make these changes, huge changes, at the end of the fiscal year, which for contractors that are getting contracts, and for us is a huge problem. So, is there going to be a big process flow change for contractors on you know September 30th when they've been awarded contracts and have to? jump into gear like this past year? It just seems it's a problem. I, I'm always ready when we do stuff on September 30th. Yeah. And I'm, I'll let uh, Heather jump in if she needs to. But I don't, our, our goal here is that intake of cases will be different. It will be invisible. Same infrastructure to put new people into it. The entirety of NBIB, including all of it, all the people, all the processes, everything, simply shifts under the Department of Defense. It's the same people, the same processes. Well, I would say the same processes, but if we do our job right, we'll be moving, changing processes, regardless of whether this is going to shift the DOD or not. Processes will evolve. You'll see new SF-86 things come out. EAP will replace EQIP at some point. That's unrelated to this change. Um, you should see no distinction um, between the end of September and the 1st of October uh, as to any case that comes in up to the 30th of October gets moved into the end of the end. Next case that comes in on October 1st, we'll move into the same inventory. It's just a, it really is a command issue. Um, over time, uh, you know, the employees of NBIB um, will become DOD employees. We have employees today, but that's again invisible to you all. Um, you should see no change in, in uh, how you. Fiscal year piece um, helps because we're we're, we're going to move the funding source internal funding source from a revolving fund, which we work with today at OPM, to a working capital fund at the Department of Defense. But that's simply, again, a change of money and change of color, not, um, not a change in process. Questions? Yes, sir. Dennis Keith, Industry. On Trusted Workforce 2.0, uh, 
Charlie, on level of effort number two with regards to the adjudicated guidelines, mm -hmm. is there uh, some sort of um, uh, timeline or expectation for um, progress? Um, I, I, I think the target, let me say two things about a target. I think the target date that we are pro talking about right now takes us to the end of 2018 to get this on the street as a final product. That said, no pun intended, these processes or these, these standards need to undergo continuous evaluation um, the, uh, after that point. We should not say we're done and everybody walks away and then sometime 70 years from now we ask ourselves did we get this right back in 2019. Um, but the target date for sort of finished uh, product um, is 2019. But I also expect, just like we saw with some of the early level of effort one things, that we may reach some aha moments between now and then and make some changes in the processes uh, earlier on just to, because of the obvious impact and be able to put it in place pretty quickly. Fine. We do have a question waiting on the phone when you're ready. Ready. Okay, opening that line. Please go ahead, your line is open. Hey, it's your friend, Lindy Kaiser. So you had some great information last time about the backlog, and so now the clearance processing timelines are kind of following an arc that we somewhat expected in that you, we saw some improvement, and then now we see things getting a little bit worse, um, which, again, does not surprise me as we await the executive order, the whole transfer process. As much as you guys hold hands and sing kumbaya, we usually see a little bit of a hiccup in terms of especially as we're rolling people into continuous evaluation. Um, but I do know that the, the efforts you're making on Trusted Workforce 2.0 this next year, you are anticipating what OT9 and OPM have said, this is the year that processing times you expect will, will improve. So I know last NISPAC meeting you made some, some good comments on the backlog and improvements there, and those held true. So I'm just curious, this NISPAC meeting, do you have goal points, timelines in mind for saying, as we update, eliminate adjudicative criteria, get these policies in place, when do we expect processing times to start meeting a better steady state? Six months, one year, two years, et cetera. Uh, Linda, it's a very fair question. Um, one of the byproducts of um, some of the early returns on the executive correspondence, and I think we're seeing some of this particularly in that reinvestigation thing, um, is that um, as we are able to take, make some changes in the way we're doing the work, we end up closing some of the old, older cases faster. And so, and they get, they, we don't count them in the, in, the, uh, in the production numbers until they are closed. And uh, um, so, so we, are, that we see old dogs is probably a bad term, but we see some old dogs filtering in. So that's why you see in some of these charts a much broader uh, level or, or span of, of um, cases in terms of aging on them, even though uh, um, we have uh, um, reduced some of the timelines on this. So um, my expectation was as we, as we start to close out the older and older things, that that will skew, will have a, a not good effect on the 90% average. Um, I think more, what I really want to show more importantly is that our median numbers are moving to the left, and that to me is a leading indicator of where the ultimate numbers will end up going and why we're headed in that direction. To your question, uh, and I've got to admit that the acoustics are not really good on the, uh, on the call here, but I think, Lindy, the question was um, when do we predict that we'll be back somewhere within the guidelines? Um, that is a really hard prediction. Um, uh, I, I can tell you, I think on our total inventory numbers, we think we'll be down uh, uh, at 300,000 or below sometime by the fall. And that, again, should have a very positive impact on the, on the timelines. Um, as we do make some changes in the process that will um, reduce the number of periodic reinvestigation, formal investigations that happen, um, and then unceremoniously dump that work all back on the agencies under a continuous evaluation and continuous vetting mode, um, that uh, uh, should re reduce the amount of cases that we have to work on and allow us to spend more time on uh, or put more assets on the, the initial cases and the PR cases that are the most important. 
Um, I expect that to have a, a positive impact. But, Lindy, when you, when you ask, do I think we'll be within ERPA guidelines within one or two years? Um, I, I hope by two years from now we are within those guidelines. I hope somewhere, somewhere before that point. Um, I think um, what also may change is um, what trusted, we're not, and we're not waiting for Trusted Workforce 2.0 to help us drive those numbers down. We're trying to drive them down before we even get there. So I'm not sure that answers the question. That's about. I can't give you an accurate answer on when I think those ERPA guidelines are going to be reached. I can. I can. They are a product of a high inventory and closing old cases, um, but um, I expect the numbers are going to start to drop. Will continue to drop and um, and drop perhaps more precipitously than they have been. The point we have not made the progress that I really want to see on meeting the ERPA guidelines the way they are measured today. That's why I took this chart to see, is there any other way we can look at this to tell us whether we're actually making progress or not? I think this chart that's up on the screen right now, hopefully you all can see it online, is um, really more indicative of, no, the numbers are still much higher than I want them to be. Oh. <laughs> yep. You're on. I am? Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Hi, Caroline Degatti from Clearance Jobs. Um, sorry to monopolize. Uh, but so I wanted to ask if you're anticipating that by the end of this year, the inventory will be of around 300,000. Um, a couple weeks ago, we had a conversation with Bill Evanina, um, and I can't remember whether it was him or someone else um, with OG and I who mentioned that the what a standing caseload should be would be about 250,000, and that that would be just the number of what it takes for government to be working regularly, that at any given time there would be about 250,000 cases. Would you agree that that number is, is accurate? Um, and if that is the case, then it seems like we aren't that far away from getting to basically just an average caseload where, where numbers really should be picking up. Um, would you anticipate that? Is that something fair? Or are there other elements that, that we're not considering? So I have the answer here. Um, Yes, I think it's fair. Um, in 2014, before um, the, we lost that investigative capacity, we were up where we needed to be in terms of investigative capacity using the pre-2012 investigative guidelines. They sort of added some complexity to it, but just to give you that sense, that in that framework, um, we had to, to meet the ERPA guidelines, which we were meeting at the time, of top secret, uh, with that level of capacity, um, the inventory that was steady state that allowed us to do it was somewhere between 180 and 200,000 at any given time in motion, an understanding that, that a subset of that would be actual Tier 3, Tier 5 cases. But that's about right. So looking at, at uh, today and looking at, at the way some of the cases have evolved, um, somewhere between two and 250,000 is a steady state, is a, is a fair estimate. What will drive that actual number will ultimately, probably a year from now, we'll be able to sit down and say, okay, now what did a trusted workforce tell us about what that case has looked like? But two to 250 is a fair estimate. Steady state would be. And once we reach that and stabilize at that point, we should be able to meet those ERPA guidelines. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay. Right, we're next going to hear from uh, Ryan Deloney from DSS, who will tell us about the deployment of the, uh, the NISC. Good morning. Ryan Deloney, Defense Security Service. And yeah, a little bit of a slide chopped off. That's okay. I'll just talk to the content on there. I want to give an update on the National Industrial Security System. As a reminder, this is the system of record for industrial security oversight for the DOD and the 30 plus other agencies um, in industry, uh, which provide cognizance there. Uh, some usage and statistics reports, we have been tracking those throughout deployment. Uh, they've been looking good. For example, we have some provisioning metrics up on the screen here. Uh, user base has been consistently growing. You can see we have uh, now around 20,000 unique roles um, broken out about 7,500 industry, 1,100 government, 600 DSS. It's been good over the past few months. We've been working just to ensure that those issues that some are happening with provisioning we're getting worked through. For example, uh, we work with the State Department trying to work through some bureaucratic tape, uh, getting um, certificates up and running within NCASE, the single sign-on platform. 
that's been resolved, and we've been tracking just to make sure all other non-DOD agencies can get in, do it. Uh, we do have about 8,000 cage codes represented. So uh, when last we met as a group, we were around 6,000, so about half, and now we're up around three quarters in terms of uh, cleared facilities within. And we're continuing to see that growth. We'll continue to track that just to make sure that um, uh, industries in as needed in order to perform their functions. Uh, other good news, we did kick off the Operational Requirements Committee, so thank you to the NISPAC team. We did coordinate membership through that as well as through industry groups uh, and other contacts. So it is a good representation of about 30 um, members and advisors across industry, government, uh, DSS, as well as um, OSDA and S uh, policy, and then DNI and other uh, advisory roles as well. So we had our first meeting, discussed uh, roles and responsibilities, laid out what's the standard process we're going to use to receive uh, requirements to help enhance the system and drive it going forward. We're going to have our first meeting to synthesize that next month, I believe on April 22nd. And we have received uh, from three groups already a uh, back batch of requirements and needs and where their thoughts were, so that's been working well. Uh, ongoing events, we have, of course, been focusing post-deployment for large system on stability and post-rollout activities. Uh, so we've been doing a lot of user support. Uh, we just had a major patch over the weekend, version 1.6.4. Uh, that did stabilize some of the core records within the system itself, so we're hoping to see a lot more of, as well as just consistency of operation. Uh, of course, we're not going to stop there. We'll continue assessing to make sure we can tune anything we need to uh, within the application to make sure it's serving its function. We also did kick off DSS, the PSI, the Personnel Security Investigation for Industry Projection Survey on Monday. So that was formally performed in a system that uh, NIS overtook when we cut over. So that is live. Uh, we sent out some communications about that yesterday, just direct emails uh, to FSOs, AFSOs, and SMOs uh, records we have within the system. So we've seen, uh, I think we were around 500 submissions when I checked yesterday afternoon, so it's up and running. And then feedback within that as well, uh, most of the feedback actually is that it seems to be an intuitive form, uh, been positive feedback, which I'll take any day uh, as far as that capability. So that's live, and we'll continue to track that as that rolls through April 5th. A couple things uh, cut off from the screen. We do continue to update our training and tools, so in addition to the step course, We've just in the past week uh, quadrupled the size of our frequently asked questions for users. So those are available within the system. We're also going to direct send those out as well as continue to build training products and tools. Other good news, uh, we've been working with our Knowledge Center staff to expand their responsiveness beyond uh, providing lock and unlock support, but actually to provide functional help. So if you have an issue, uh, you can call them instead of needing to send an email and wait for a response. You can call and get on the phone. They can walk you through, uh, can actually proxy in and see your screen and help walk you through your issues that you may be having. Uh, so we're ramping that up. That should be active by the end of this month. Uh, and those are all the high-level updates. Was kind of keeping it uh, high up here, but wanted to open for any questions specific to the system operation feedback. I'll ask. Uh, please, one or two. Uh, thank you, Brian, for the, the briefing. So this is the system of record for the Industrial Security Program. Is this, this is, right now, this is the system. There's no other automated system. Is that correct? Correct. In terms of the core records for facility clearances, which companies are cleared, uh, this is that system. We do have ancillary systems, such as uh, OBMS for information system authorization, which will be evolving to EMAS uh, later this year. Mm -hmm. And we're working interfaces for that activity, but as far as which companies are cleared, this is that. So, and commend you on the good progress, like you said, 6,000 or so from the last meeting, of, which means there's, I don't know, 4,000 or so that are not enrolled. Um, and this system, as I understand it, is what is used to report annual self-inspections, facility change conditions, facility verifications, things like that. So for those that aren't enrolled, is it, does that mean they just do it manually and submit something? That's one question. Then the other one is, what's the strategy for bringing those other four or 5,000 on? And I guess I'd tack on a third one, just, and it's probably covered in the operational group, that we make sure we keep the NISP in if it comes to a point where we you know, mandate the other four or 5,000 join in. 
Correct. So I think I got all three. I'll cover those uh, down the line. So we are we are tracking usage. It is required for any uh, you know, policy mandated functions such as your self inspection certification, um, reporting change conditions. Uh, so that is all performed in system. We're not taking those outside. Uh, it is there's unique workflows, transparency, process improvement, communication. So we do as those are required. Uh, industry is required to submit with that venue. We've been discussing, and it was also discussed on the clearance working group, uh, exploring towards the end of the, the fiscal year whether an ISL may be needed just to uh, further clarify the requirement for use and registration. Uh, so we're exploring that, took that as an action item from the last group. And we will continue to plug in both through the requirements committee. We also have a relationship just with the NCMS chairs and representatives. So we'll primarily work through NCMS if we ever need to make a big push to any. Uh... OK. Thank you. Any other questions for Ryan? Phone? A quick reminder to those on the phone, press pound two if you'd like to ask a question. And at this time, we have no questions. Thank you. Next year from our executive agent of the NISP, Jeffrey Spinach. Um, so good morning. I. Um, uh, as was said, I'm Jeff Spinzer from DOD. I really don't have a lot to uh, to provide in terms of um, new information other than to say I'm, uh, I'm really happy to be here. I was pleased to the opportunity to meet with uh, with Mark and uh, and the folks over here, um, uh, and I, I enjoyed the prospects of a very close working relationship. Um, I, I am the, not new to the NISPAC, um, and I do find that the things that you're aspiring it to be um, you know, collegial, but a place for um, to get stuff done. Uh, that and uh, and when we do it that way, it works very very well. Um, creates some accountability on both sides of the ledger. Uh, if you think of it that way, and I don't mean to seem like that, you know, we're we're, we're two parts of the same whole, but we have you know complementary responsibilities there that are similar. Same, um, but I think when we're able to use the forum the way it's supposed to work very well, and so I'm very pleased to uh, shot to uh, to be here. So unless uh, someone has any questions for me, I'm going to give you four minutes and 30 seconds back. <laughs> okay, we're going to move on. Uh, anybody have, have any questions for Jeff on the phone or anything like that before we, we, we move on? No questions waiting at this time. Lovely. All right, we're now going to hear from uh, Quentin Wilkes. Industry uh, spokesperson. Let me get my. Yeah. Go to the next slide, please. Um, quick agenda. We're going to talk a little bit about the NISPAC and MOU, uh, touch on some policy changes and some impacts, and then we're going to get into uh, uh, challenges maybe that we're having and uh, finish up with some old business. Next slide. Um, again, we want to welcome. Brian Mackey from BAE, he's our newest NISPAC member. Um, we did have Kirk Paulson, we want to thank him for his time when he was on. Uh, different things changed and he had to step down and uh, move on to other endeavors. So, Brian, welcome. We don't have any changes when it comes to the, the MOUs, everybody's remaining the same. Um, other than uh, Matt Hollingsworth, he's, he's holding two right now, but we're trying to work to get uh, the PS as is person. When it comes to the next slide, when it comes to the policy changes and impact, um, there's there's a lot of policies that are impacting not just industry but also government as it stands today. Um, so one of the things that that we suggest from industry is that we leverage leverage industry's industry's expertise as we move forward. Sometimes we have meetings or the government hopes have meetings and they don't always have the right people in the meeting all the time. So we're asking that moving forward that you leverage industry's expertise. Hopefully some of the, the, the policies that are coming out will be easily or more easily implemented moving forward. Next slide. When it comes to CY, um, industry is, is Still having some challenges when it comes to DFAR uh, compliance for CDI on 
unclassified networks. Okay. So um, what industry requests is that we can get some guidance on DFARS compliance when it pertains to uh, DSS assessments moving forward. Okay. Um, the more guidance we have, the better we can uh, help everyone moving forward to make sure that, that uh, help everyone moving forward to, to ensure that, that the, the right guidance and people are taking care of what they need to take care of. Um, when it comes to DSS and transition, um, one of the things that we asked in the last meeting that, is that we could have a meeting to discuss where DSS is going, where they are, and, and what we want to see or what we would like to see moving forward in the future. Uh, yesterday we did have a meeting. Yesterday we did have a meeting um, with the industry core group and DSS. We talked about uh, where, where we are now with, DS, with DSS in transition, um, where we're going in the future. One of the things that we talked about was uh, the new rating system that they're coming up with. We had a lot of questions. Um, it was an initial meeting. It, it wasn't a, a done deal with any of the, the, the things that we discussed. It was just DSS given us an idea of what they're looking for in the future. We're hoping that as, as they move along with the, the rating process, that they'll really engage with industry um, and, and we can provide guidance to help ensure that whatever they're going to implement moving forward is something that's, that's implementable and acceptable from both industry and government. Next slide. When it comes to uh, insider threat, there was, there was in the, the voice of industry, there was a, um, a message that that DSS is working on the ISL for um, for evaluating insider threat effectiveness, and we're looking forward to seeing the ISL and providing comments, um, hopefully to assist in in having a good transition from to the next phase of inside threat. When it comes to the, to the NID and the timelines, we're seeing that the timelines and NIDs are, are continually growing. Um, we already touched a little bit on that. That was one of the things that was, that was top 10. Um, and we're requesting that in the future that, that we could institute or put back in place, Greg, the, the, the working groups for both NID and insider threat to hopefully come up with some things moving forward that can help with the transition. As far as the, the, the Trusted Workforce 2.0, um, currently, <clears throat> currently there is no NISPAC representation um, when it comes to the Trusted Workforce meeting. We, you know, Charlie Fillin did say that you know, there's two industry people that attend the meetings. Um, but those industry people aren't allowed to or haven't in the past uh, talked to or, or, or talked to the, or coordinated with the NISPAC on anything that's being said in the meetings. What we're requesting is that, uh, industry, uh, is that a NISPAC member attend the meetings um, and, and hopefully be able to, to come back and provide extra or provide information to the rest of the industry and hopefully provide um, additional guidance to, to help as they move forward with trusted workforce. Greg already talked about the meeting that we have with uh, ODNI later this month, and we're hoping we're hoping that you know we'll be able to discuss uh, some policy issues that are coming in the future that may impact industry, and uh, and hopefully you know have a good discussion on any of the seeds that may be uh, coming in the future. Next slide. As far as the systems that, that industry is using, I mean, right now there's a lot of systems coming out that, that you know, it looks like every week it's a different system that we're having to address and, and provide training and, and, and teach people how to use. Um, industry is requesting that, that, that the government continues to collaborate with industry by having um, additional working group meetings. Right now we have working group meetings, but sometimes they're not often enough to actually uh, keep
keep things moving in the direction that we need to go. Okay? Um, so if, if we could have more meetings to address some of our concerns, then maybe that will help when it comes to some of the challenges that we're having um, once we start using the system in the field. Next slide. One of the, the, the good things is that industry finally received information back when it comes to the consultant white paper. Um, the only thing that's, that's still lagging out there is that uh, sometimes when consultants are trying to get access to, to JPAS, they're having some challenges, and DSS is going to take that back to DMDC to see if they can come up with um, uh, either some changes or a way forward that's going to help them get access when a company has a person that's, that's not available, um, can't create account for a consultant, and, a cult and, and they need access, whether they're an account manager or just need access to help them get the job done. Industry needs specific guidance on policy to address security consultants. Um, the reason why we need, we're, we're asking for that is if there's a lot of security consultants start to, to pop up out there, and, and there's not a lot of guidance to say what they can and can't do. So we're, we're looking for you guys to tell us, you know, uh, to, or to put out some guidance on what what can they do, what can't they do when it when it pertains to consulting services for a clear company, especially when they're not employees, they're actually consultants. We're still awaiting implement next slide. We're still awaiting um, implementation guidance for C3 and uh, industry requests to review and comment on C3 on the C3 ISL before it's released to industry. Next slide. Greg already talked or touched on the uh, Advisory Committee on Industrial Security and Industrial-Based Policy. Um, industry is requesting that the ISU be one of the members, if possible, um, so they can be the voice for industry moving forward. I'm going to put you on the spot just for a second. Uh, back to the 2.0 and, and these two industry representatives. Can you do you know uh, how these are selected or, or, or how they are chosen? And, and, and secondly, I mean, is there a way to yeah, right? Is there a way to to integrate the NISPAC more into this process? Um, currently, the ESG is called the Executive Steering Group was convened by the executive agent OPM and DNI of the PAC. Um, it's a very small group. A few agencies are involved, and the small group has been meeting monthly just so there's continuous and continuity of making some of the decisions. It has not been changed in the working group. I just know that two members of an industry base were invited to participate, and they've been involved in some of the um, discussions in the process. And then decisions are then filtered down to um, the staff at the executive agent agencies along with the PAC, and we're working through the policy structure. Have not been sent out yet to a community <coughs> um, to comment on anything. It's really just the policy structure and approach is being discussed. Vital part of this, but it should be more integrated. In yeah, well, in fact, Dan McGarvey Industry um, and Quentin asked me to, to really kind of focus on the transparency issues. And so taking a look at it from a, a larger perspective, and I think Greg went through the number of issues that, that industry is concerned about it. And industry is not <coughs> concerned so much about writing policy. It's the impact that policy would or could have, which is where the issue is. Um, I will say in support of, of the things that Valerie and have been working, um, as, as you've heard, uh, we're going to have that meeting on the 28th with Bill of and Eva. I also understand that, that there's been developed a very extensive communication plan to be able to share with industry as, as progress goes on with trusted workforce. So I think, I think that the ICU support has been critical in that area. Uh, the other thing I would mention is, is that even though we can't talk specifics, I would refer, and I'll, I'll pass this on, there was a wonderful interview done with the uh, Federal News Network Service with Bill Avaniva that really outlines a lot of information, not specifics yet, but certainly enough that has been passed out. So I'll give that to you as that could be part of the minutes. But I, I will say things are working pretty well.
And I'll just add to, and I believe some of the people who are here were invited, there was a press event. And um, all the newspapers um, are out, is out for review of the basic Articles out yeah, there. so so we're, we're very happy with what's going on right now with the PAC and the PMO. <clears throat> We'd love to see more transparency in other areas as well. Obviously, yeah. Okay. No, I I, really, I think it's been pretty well well covered and brief. What I okay. heard from you and Dan. All right. Well, that's progress, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, anybody have any questions for us? Uh, That includes anybody on the phone. Okay. And once again, please press pound two on your telephone if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment. Pound two. Mm -hmm. Next one here from Keith Leonard on the DSS. So good morning, Keith Meyer, Defense Security Service. 2018 was a really busy year. 2019 will be even busier for DSS as we continue our current missions, implement new missions, and prepare for pending missions. So one of the things I do want to say is, uh, Quentin, as we talk about things, over the last month or so uh, in several sessions, DSS, DOD, ISU, and the industry has met together to work to address some of these issues and, and look for a solution forward. So I've got a couple of updates for you, and this comes from a lot of stuff we see in the policy office. One is Industry may have seen a memo from the OUSDI reference derivative classification training for derivative classifiers. That memo applies to, to DOD, not NISP, unless applied by your government contract. So any consideration about changing your uh, training from biannually to annually uh, would come from your government contract, and NISPOM applies national standards, which requires initial training and then biannual for those classifiers. The second is, um, it just I believe it just got posted yesterday, the day before, but the certificate for foreign, uh, pertaining to foreign interest, the SF-328, was revised. Don't worry, the questions didn't change. What was updated was the capabilities for the form and the information collection to be used for the Department of Homeland Security Classified Critical Information or Infrastructure Protection Program. Um, it allows them to support them as a CSA, as well as the Pending Defense and Enhanced Security Program, um, which is still uh, in works with the Department of Defense. So that was the primary two updates for that form. The form will have a new date. It's good through 2021. So don't get concerned about questions once you can be in change. The next thing is, is uh, we must have did a good job with industry as a whole. Uh, you really took on the task last year when we posted the notice about seed four and uh, return of foreign passports. We, on February 5th, we posted the industrial security letter. We've heard nothing since we posted it, which means that when the trigger was pulled last year, it seems like everything was done. The ISL just replaces the posting and provides formal guidance. The last thing which was brought up a little while ago by Quentin was the fact that insider threat. And May 16, May 16 uh, 2016, um, the, uh, the NISPOM change two was issued, which implied insider threat requirements for cleared industry. So we're nearing the three year mark on this now. Um, industry did a tremendous job in the first year implementing the core requirements. We could, we could consider really most companies out there at FOC. Now we've got to look at maturity and effectiveness. We're actually in the process right now of internal and formal coordination of an ISL that was drafted that will rescind and replace the current ISL 2016-02 and update um, and address uh, maturity and effectiveness as we go along. We are aligning like we did last time with national standards and processes. We're not creating a new world for anybody. We want to make sure that we stay consistent with that. Uh, that being said, as we had great success last time working with industry in a partnership on this, as well as our government partners, whether it be the CSAs, the, the National Insider Threat Task Force, ISU, and others, to make sure that we had the right product and the right tools and resources to support them. So we see the industrial security letter as part of a package that would require the update of CDSE products and tools related to insider threat, job aids, plan templates, and down the road as we move along training. So we're in formal coordination right now within the, uh, the agency. Uh, we'll go to, once we get the comments back from the senior action officer level, we'll move to our internal formal coordination. 
We'll work along the way to engage the NISPAC and our partners, as well as ISU, as we move forward. We think we have a product that enables various companies based on their size and complexity, whether they have a standalone or corporate program, to begin that next step in the process to look at the maturity level of their programs and, and how the effectiveness rolls into different components of their part of the inside threat plans. Subject to your questions. I got a question. This is Keith Industry. Um, given Valerie's comment earlier with regards to evaluating DFARS compliance and the DCMA uh, memo that was sent out, is there a current position with, within DSS on the evaluation of CDI on? Uh... So, well, you may have seen the memo of DCMA moving on in this. Uh, the Department of Defense is, is, is establishing a common approach to DFARS compliance. Well, and then we've talked to a few industry groups about this before. DSS will have a role when it comes to CUI and, and compliance with 800 -171. We see our roles with cleared industry, but as with anybody else in the Department of Defense, whether it be DCMA, DSS, or the requiring activities who will also have a role, the, the view of a common approach and a set of common standards to implement this, so that enables reciprocity across the department. So as we move along, in fact, the department right now is in the process of, of developing its CUI instruction and we're, and we're partnering in that process to make sure that the work we did last year and look at the, the, the did side of this is implied in the, in the policy requirements of the department. <coughs> we had a lot of success working with our partners from services and acquisitions and uh, CIO this last year, and I think we built a lot of bonds and capabilities, but back to your question is, is that the department will have to carry on with a common approach. But is there a position today that DSS is assessment process? Right now, we are not assessing for formal purposes 800-171. Dan McGraw of the industry. Well, I think along the lines of transparency, I think CUI is going to have a tremendous impact in industry. And the concern is obviously costing, among other things, and timeliness. So I would encourage that as that policy gets developed, we have some impact meetings in terms of what it is, in fact, going to do to industry, the extent of the effects on industry. And I think as we know more about it, the better we'll be able to prepare for it. Well, I think one of the things that is that um, CUI is applied in the same manner as the NIST is with the FAR clause. It's applied by the DFARS clause 712 that lays out the specific requirements of 800-171. We will see some changes as we go along. In the FAR community, there's a FAR clause being developed for the national level for CUI, but I think maybe Mark Riddle can pull up some of that information to go along, so I don't want to step in his lane, but it goes back to looking at consistency across the process. What we need to strive for is that if you've been assessed by someone on 8171 for whatever period of time that is, that assessment should hold valid for others who have, unless they've got, unless they have some increased requirements pertaining to the type of CUI, which as we know, there's 124 different categories. Not all are equal um, for that process. Well, I appreciate that. And as I recall one time, I had a dentist doing a root canal, and he said, well, it's not going to hurt much. But he was referring to him, not me. So we just want to be careful about how we go about this. Thank you. Mark Little. Yeah, we're going to have to move off the second half. Yeah. 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 Um, I actually thought we were going to take a break before I went on, so I just went, I'm glad I didn't walk out of the room. Um, thank you very much, Mark Riddle, with the CUI program. I'm going to give you some, some of the high notes here. Um, we're kind of going a little bit of out of order, what you see on the slide. First thing, um, I'm only, they're only giving me five minutes today, so there's a good chance I'm not going to be able to address 
all of your questions, and you probably have a bunch. Uh, but we do have a regular update that we provide to stakeholders. Uh, of course, the next one is going to be April 17th. The one after that is going to be July 17th. If you want to participate, it's open to anybody. Just subscribe to our CUI blog. The call-in information is there. If you have a question that you want specifically addressed during the update to stakeholders, please submit them to see. Good chance based off of questions that if you have them, others have them as well. Um, when we say stakeholders in the CY program, we mean agencies, industry, academia, state, local, tribal. So everybody is on the call. Everybody could potentially be impacted by the gentleman at the end that CY will have a, a huge impact on uh, the way the government operates and also state local votes. So April 17th, definitely subscribe to the blog on that. Also, um, on June 21st, we're going to be having a CUI Industry Day. We had our first one um, in December right before the shutdown. Um, it was pretty good, you know, um, but I think that based off of the interest that we had from agencies and industry, um, it seemed that folks wanted to see more from um, industry in regard to vendors. So, of course, we've upped the game a little bit. Uh, last year we had uh, spots for about 10 10 vendors to come and showcase products and services that are available to assist agencies and other folks implementing the program. This year we have about 23 spots. First come, first serve. Um, again, send your request to CUI at narrow.gov. Subscribe to the blog for more information. Spots are filling up quick. Um, it's going to be open to everybody. We're going to have a short introduction in this room right here, and then we're going to open up the floor for um, just to kind of walk and, and learn about the, what folks have developed to help assist with the program. Uh, first bullet here, uh, agency implementation. Right now we're about two years and a couple months into implementation, and agencies have really taken a lot of momentum uh, with their, their strides to implement this program. Last year, you'll note that the annual report to the president had a very colorful chart in it that highlighted what everybody was doing in fiscal year 17. There was a lot of um, reaction based off of that chart because it showed that not a whole lot was happening. Uh, this year, of course, that same chart will be in the annual report, and it shows significant progress. Right now, we're sitting on about seven government agencies who have asserted full implementation of the program, which means that those agencies are marking and protecting this information. Now, other agencies, and, and there's about 101 that we're tracking throughout the executive branch, are uh, asserting to us a, a, a very advanced state of implementation, which means that if they don't already have a completed policy on the street, they predict that they're going to have one by this summer or this fall, and that's most of the agencies inside. After a policy is issued within an agency, it kind of flows like a domino effect. Then you see training, then you see the physical environment be modified, systems transition to the standards, and also contracts and agreements. A little bit about the federal acquisition regulation that Keith kind of mentioned earlier. Of course, it is right now being circulated among agencies for comment. Um, this draft will be out for public comment in the near future. We actually anticipate now probably about the see something on the street. Again, if you subscribe to the CUI blog, you're going to get a hyperlink to the current draft, our associated CUI form, which is going to be how agencies convey these requirements and the standards and also the reporting timelines as far as when you're going to be providing comments. Right now, our estimate for when this FAR will be on the street for agencies to use will be sometime in the fall. So you can look at October, November time frame, uh, depending on when you think fall is. But it will be this year sometime. So more to come on that, of course. Um, on the April 17th stakeholder meeting, we'll provide another update on the FAR. So every time that get further and further into this year, we get more and more clarity on when that will happen. So I'm hoping that by the April 17th meeting we'll have an indicator of this public. Also, um, you'll notice on my slides here I have some pretty colors on the slide. Um, we've, we've developed some new cover sheets and media labels for the CY program. We've had cover sheets out there for a while, um, but there was some discussion at the CY Advisory Council and um, also stakeholders that there was a need to standardize these things even further. Uh, we had three cover sheets before. Do you notice that they were green? We consolidated them down into one. Existing stocks of old cover sheets can be used. 
the supplies. But now we have a new form that's available for download from GSA on our site for use. It has the similar feature to one of our older forms where uh, there's going to be space for you to populate or agencies to populate the unique handling associated with that particular type of CUI. Also, the smaller labels that you see here are, are brand new. Um, these are standard forms, of course, 901, 902, and 903. Media labels are, of course, for use with different types of media, whether they be hard drives or USB drives, what have you. Be available for purchase from GSA and additional information um, in the near future. We actually expect that these will be available for purchase about um, this month, by the end of next month. So they'll be out there in the standard booklet if you bought the media labels for the classified systems. It's very similar to that. Um, although the CUI program does have this, um, the reality that USB drives will be used in the program. So we, we created a special label just for those. Um, and that's about all I have um, in regard to um, implementation for the CUI program update. More on April 17th, but I will open it up for any questions or reactions. Hopefully you guys like the new color of the cover sheet. And if you do not like it, you know, I really don't want to. <laughs> actually, because um, it's too late, <laughs> it's already finalized. But um, actually positive feedback, negative feedback is always sought after. And I think I, I had a question right here from this lady. Is that right? If you could just shout it out and I'll play it back for everybody if you'd like. Oh, so the question is, Amy Roundtree from, I um, can't remember the company name, NRC, but why the change from uh, green to purple? Well, it wasn't just that we're from Baltimore, right, <laughs> like the Ravens. It was actually, um, there, there was a lot of pushback early on in the, the development of the cover sheets in regard to the color. Believe it or not, the CUI Advisory Council debated for a number of months on what the color of this stupid sheet would be. <laughs> And of course, we settled at that time on green because right at that particular moment, the FOUO cover sheet was green. Uh, when it came time to make the shift, of course, from the green to the purple, it wasn't just a shift in color. It was actually a shift in the type of form that we were pushing. Um, you'll notice that the forms that were previously available, the uh, green sheets, were actually optional forms. This purple sheet is a standard form, standard form 9-0. And the requirements to use these things are, are kind of laid out in a new CUI notice. If you went to our website, there's a great page that you should definitely take check out. It's our policy and guidance page. We issue clarifying guidance to agencies and stakeholders regarding the program. There's a notice out there that speaks to these cover sheets and how they can be used. Um, I, I think that there was a lot of um, questions around the issue of an optional form when really the, the truth of the matter is is that if you're going to use a cover sheet, this is the one you have to use. So the standard form kind of came off as a little more authoritative. Make a, a break from the, the purple so that way people would recognize the change. Question. Uh, yes, ma'am? Okay, the question uh, from Michelle Sutton is, of course, when is NIST SP-800-171 Rev-2 going to be available for public comment? Now, um, of course, some of you may not know that, of course, the Rev-2 of the 171 is, has been rattling around inside of the government right now. Uh, one of the main changes that you're going to see in this document, and I will get to the question, of course, is um, there's a new appendix in Rev-2 of the 171 that speaks to security requirements related to an advanced persistent threat. Basically, if an agent's persistent threat to the information or a particular system, they can use the 171 Rev 2 Appendix F to push out protection. The core requirements in the 171 that you see and that you've, you've grown to love, I hope, are not going to change in this, this revision. Um, right now, we don't have word on the exact time frame for when this publication is going to be out for comment. It was actually supposed to be out already, but I think the internal comment period between agencies kind of So as soon as those comments are resolved among agencies, we will be posting it again. Uh, when the 171 Rev 2 is out for public comment, we will put it to our blogs. I'm not emphasizing that enough. I think that that's where we really do our communication to all stakeholders. I highly recommend that you take a look at this uh, document when it's on the street. For some of you who've been um, 
I don't know, lucky enough to see the draft, you'll notice that there are some things in Appendix F that will probably raise a couple of eyebrows um, to um, safeguarding requirements, because it isn't just a technical document in regard to how to protect systems. There are some statements in there about uh, personal um, vetting, personnel vetting issues, too. So more to come on that, of course. Um, any additional questions? That was a great one. The comment, I don't think I heard you mention it. We, in ISU, as the executive agent for the CUI program, um, a lot having credit to do to Mark, started the process of doing our own assessment implementation of the agency's uh, progress on uh, implementing CUI. So we have started to line up assessments of some of the agencies, as Mark mentioned, I think we say seven are at full implementation. And I just wanted you to know, so as part of that, if they have issued contracts, we'll be looking at that as, as well, despite our, our ask to do all this. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's that's actually, oh, yeah, that's absolutely uh, correct. So right now, of course, uh, one of my, my day job is, you know, I run a small oversight team where we, we actually Sense agencies. So based on the annual report submissions in fiscal year 18, you know, agencies asserted wherever they were in the, the implementation movie, um, whether they have draft policy, whether they have initiated training, what, what have you. Um, so depending on the state of their implementation that they asserted, my team is actually engaging with them. We're, we're kind of like that old saying, like from Missouri, they say it, now we want to see it. We want to see what that policy looks like. And our, and our job is to ensure that it's consistent with the executive order and, of course, the CFR. Um, sometimes, you know, early on in the drafting process, agencies take some liberties with the policy, or they've tried to take some liberties with the CY policy, and that's our job to go in there and get them back on the rails as far as what those standards are. There are some clear lines in the sand on what an agency can do and what they can't do with their CUI policies, especially when it comes to implementing those standards onto um, non-federal We're watching. We're the O and oversight, right? Um, any additional questions? We're on the phone for Mark Riddle. No questions at this time on the phone. Okay. Thank, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Let's take a uh, ten-minute break. Well, um, we will start again at uh, about 10, to, 10 to 12. 10 to 12. Okay, we're going <coughs> to excuse me. Here next from the Defense Vetting Director, uh, Heather Stokes. Heather. Heather Stokes. Heather Stokes. That was good. Hi, everyone. I'm Tricia Stokes. Um, I know Heather better, but um, uh, you got me. Uh, I wasn't even supposed to be here today, so I uh, appreciate you uh, you hearing me and, and allowing me to speak, um, panel. And, uh, and, and so I'm the director of the Defense Vetting Directorate, and the Defense Vetting Directorate uh, is the directorate that was established in DSS. I'll go to the next slide. There you go. Um, uh, about a year ago now, I think I spoke with you when we had just been birthed, um, and at that point in time, I think most of you know that we were uh, anticipating taking back the background investigation mission for, for the Department of Defense. And, uh, and then within two or three months, we uh, realized uh, the President directed we would take back the back federal government. So um, bottom line is we were establishing, we were preparing, we were establishing what we called our landing team. And, and as we stood up, um, the very first thing we did is looked at ourselves uh, internally and what we were getting ready to inherit uh, in terms of with the Department of Defense CAF, Mr. Ned Fish and his organization, and uh, what Dan Payne and I um, settled on was we would put all things vetting under the same directorate in DB, uh, which we named, probably change as we inherit the, the federal mission uh, as we're anticipating the executive um, and, and, uh, but we knew we needed to start by putting all things vetting that existed together because it made sense to do so. So what, what you know, what that really enti in, entailed was really what you see in the left-hand corner on our silos of excellence. So what you usually or previously knew as the PSMOI um, is now the Vetting Risk Operations Center. I would tell you that that will be our, uh, our nucleus of operations forward. 
and that will be um, head, headed by uh, Heather Stokes, or I'm sorry, Heather Green, and um, and <laughs> and uh, and yeah. so she's uh, she's she's preparing to uh, to inherit um, at really the the crux of, of the operational elements. Um, we also included Insider Threat, so most of you know, may know the DITMAC, the Defense Insider Threat Management Analytics Center that, that we own. Um, I think what you will learn in the future as Trusted Workforce 2.0 is rolled out, as people have spoken about in this forum today, um, that uh, the Insider Threat Mission will be what becomes continuous vetting. So pairing those, integrating those together in the same organization seemed like the right thing to do, and we're very glad we did. A lot of data sharing back and forth, and, and there's a lot of economies of scale that we can achieve by doing that. We also have a program that we've just established called Enhanced Screening Protocols, and what that really is is it's getting after uh, the foreign associations on that great form SF86 that you fill out. Anything is contacts, foreign associations, foreign travel. Um, it, it's what kind of indices uh, do we look at to really be able to get the appropriate information to mitigate risk? So that's what that program is, is about. We are, we are starting it with um, the military accessions as directed by the DepSec Def, um, and, um, but I think it's, it's, it's going to be bold and, and we are going to look at embedding that process in what will become the transformed background investigation process in the future. And then certainly not to forget um, where we're going with Trusted Workforce 2.0. Uh, the, the Defense Vetting Directorate is working hand in hand with uh, the, uh, all the workforce, the PAC CMO, who's really doing the heavy lift. Um, and, and, and we're also a representative uh, on, the, on the steering committee uh, group that, that is forming the policy and making the decisions because it's kind of important to us because we will be the executionary of that. We will have to execute this. Uh, in, in, uh, in, in practicality. And then last but not least is Mr. Ned Fish, who probably would have been doing um, this, this briefing uh, if I wasn't here today. And, and Ned is, as most, most of you know, the director of the Department of Defense CAF, was gracious enough to open his doors to the Defense Vetting Directorate in Fort Meade um, in last year. And um, that's when we really kind of became one. We started integrating way before we were directed to, to integrate. And um, Ned is being, has been very gracious to us, not just in, in that, um, but also leading up to help me with a lot of the big, bigger things that we have to do. I mean, we're, we're, we're practicing on integrating organizations with his organization, which is about 692, about 700 people, uh, only to get ready for Charlie's organization, which we will inherit, you know, which is, comes in the, in the cast of thousands. Um, and, and so it, it, it's, a, it's a great test case, but we have, I think, integrated exceptionally well, and, and our business processes just belong together, so it, it's, worked, it's worked very well. So um, a little, just a real quick snapshot of what we look like today, and the, what, I, what I really want to point out is that part on the left-hand side, the NBISPCO, so the National Background Investigation Service. Um, what that is, is Mr. Terry Carpenter, he is the PEO, the Program Executive Officer, building the new enterprise, the new vetting enterprise for all of us. Um, and, and so Terry came on about the same time last year as, as I did. Um, we, we hit the ground running and we realized that we were partners uh, and we had to be no gap between us. He's building what we need to find the requirements. He builds it. Um, he's building it in an agile framework um, capability. I could spend an hour up here talking just about this work chart or really just about what uh, the NBIS uh, program and the um, DVD program that I know we have a lot of forums coming up that will be um, will be associated with each other uh, at I think uh, Clinton or put up the, the, the chart of all the conferences coming up and I think uh, what I will commit to you is and, and Heather Heather Shokes and I have been talking about this um, uh, a lot, uh, and, and um, that is how we, we take all these engagements and what she does so well with, with the community, this community, um, and how we will engage what you see in that uh, block called Enterprise Business Support Office. That, that's really my 
business office that will be interacting with all of our customers, building the requirements, working with the PEO, working the strategy, working the strategic comms, working the training issues, working all strategic engagements with our customers. Um, which, you know, we thought getting to the Department of Defense was a big thing, but then you add the other 105 agencies that, um, that uh, Charlie mentioned, uh, that's now a bigger thing. Um, but industry that, again, Heather pretty much has a handle on uh, anyway, um, but helping her engage with you to make sure you're an inclusive partner in this process, building the requirements, testing the capabilities, uh, really, really interacting with us. That, that is my commitment to this community. Um, and so now I will get off the podium and let the two people who you really want to talk to, who were the highlighted boxes, and that's Heather in the Vetting Risk Operations Center, and um, Ned will follow uh, on the DOD adjudications uh, facility information. And then we'll take any questions. Good afternoon. Uh, Heather Green, Director of Veteran Risk Operations Center, previously known as PSMOI. Uh, so I wanted to give you uh, just a few updates on, from a metrics perspective. Uh, currently, we have, so far this fiscal year, we have submitted uh, a little over 54,000, probably at more uh, 55,000 at this point, investigation requests. Uh, good news is we are fully funded this fiscal year, and we are pretty much running at a steady state. Um, and what that means is we, we carry an average inventory of 10 to uh, 12,000, sometimes a little bit lower, uh, but it usually hovers at that 12,000 mark. Um, so far this fiscal year, we have deferred uh, over 16,000 periodic investigations into continuous evaluation. Um, we have processed over 40,000 interim determinations, and we are averaging about 15 days for that interim determination timeline. Um, a few reminders from the intertermination uh, perspective is that we do ask you to submit your fingerprint uh, uh, simultaneously or, or prior to the equip submission, uh, but we certainly wait for those fingerprint results to come back. Um, therefore, that's why we, we hold a little bit of inventory for our initials because we have to wait for the fingerprints to be there at the same time as we So as, as soon as you can submit those fingerprints, um, the better so that we can keep those uh, packages moving through the process. Um, one other note, you know, I know that uh, during the industry stakeholder meeting on Monday, we talked a little bit about getting information out there to everyone on continuous evaluation and the deferment process and making sure the messaging is out there. So uh, please stay tuned. Um, we will be posting something on the DSS website closely with Quinton and company to ensure that we are capturing some of your questions. It's going to be some additional FAQs we're going to put out there as far as, um, you know, how, how the reciprocity works, right, what avenue you have to communicate with us when you're concerned or if there are any questions on it, as well as um, when you submit a PR based on the enrollment date and, and disk. So we're going to provide that information to you. Thank you. All right, folks. Hello, my name is uh, Ned, but you can call me Heather Fish. Uh, uh, Ned Fish from the DOD CAF, and uh, I, I just want to uh, highlight a couple of points that uh, Ms. Stokes pointed out earlier. Uh, we, we started integrating closely. We, you know, we've been working closely with Heather and the team for, for years now. Uh, Ms. Stokes and her team moved into the, the CAF facility up at, at Fort Meade last summer, uh, and we've been working very closely ever since. The IB is leaning in and working very closely with DS. We were chopped, opcon under the direction and control of, uh, of DSS and DVD as of 28th of January. So we're formally aligned uh, under under the Defense Security Service and DVD now. I want to talk to you about a few things here on this slide. Uh, one is everybody around here has been around long enough to know that uh, the backlogs aren't gone when the investigations are done. You know, backlogs, all, all cases that are investigated must be adjudicated. Uh, and so there, we're in a bit of a fight these days, and I think it's no surprise to, to you all. Uh, and, and I think we'll be in a bit of a fight for another year or so, because as NBIB ramps up and surges and pushes cases to us, we're in the, you know, the, the sword fight with them as we're trying to adjudicate those cases. But, but we are making some good progress. Uh, first of all, as, as we look at Trusted Workforce 2.0 and some of the implications there, and as you look at the Secretary of Defense's we are prioritizing our work on readiness and, and 
uh, threat. So if you see that left block there, you know, what, what makes sure you get somebody to work or somebody else in the Department of Defense gets somebody to work? So we're prioritizing initials. We're prioritizing those reciprocity requests. Uh, interim SCIs are critical to getting people to work as well as the upgrades and those other things. On the right side, there's a threat aspect. We have to make sure that we are doing our job in, in concert with uh, the rest of the security officers and, and folks in the personal security enterprise to mitigate the threats that are out there. So we are also prioritizing receipts of both incident reports and the CE hits that are validated by Heather's team and then forwarded to the DOD staff. Also, on the PR side, we are, we are prioritizing those higher risk PRs, those with the major DROG and other things. What is going to the bottom of the pot as we, uh, as we work in this priority are some of those uh, uh, minor to no DROG periodic investigations. So, so if you look at the work in progress, right now today for industry, we have about 52,000 cases in our work in progress. Um, if you heard what Mr. Phelan said earlier, and you looked at what the DOD CAF has here in front of you today as a work in progress, you have, there is no right today in one spot where you can look at the end-to-end -end metrics. But the good news is when you look at the numbers of cases that were in the DOD's, in, in DOD cases that were in the pipeline, either NBIB or the CAF, last June, it's over 60,000 cases fewer are in the pipeline today than were in the pipeline of the NBIB or the CAF in June. A large part of that, about two-thirds of that, is due to the deferral uh, submission. Another part of that, about well, the other third of that 60,000, is due to the CAF upgunning and, and trying to stay ahead of the flow of cases coming to us from NBIB, um, and, and we're making some good progress there. We had some dark days last fall between uh, once that correspondence was signed out in June, NBIB really started pushing cases to us primarily in August and September. We had some system issues, uh, but right now, as of the new year, we're ramped up pretty well. And I'll give you an example. Last week, we closed 24,000 cases. A year ago, we were closing about 14,000 cases. So we are up gunning, moving forward, and you see some of the uh, things, the reasons for that. It's kind of off the slide, though, but we're looking hard at So we are now on this. You know, we've been on this for a while, and we're getting better on this and consolidating on this and working to improve this, the speed of the system. Um, also off the screen up here is, you know, the targeting and prioritization of work, some of that you see on the uh, readiness versus threat. Um, looking to expand e-adjudication, hopefully. And in the next few months, we'll get a bump up in the cases, those Tier 3 cases and Tier 1 cases that are able to be electronically adjudicated and not manually dealt with. Um, and again, and as surging resources, so whether it's from DSS and leaning on some of the capabilities that DVD brings to us, for Lean Six Sigma and other, and other surges, uh, you know, uh, taking people off of their day jobs and putting them back onto production, even policy job or something else, so uh, doing every, everything we can to surge uh, the work there. Um, I want to talk a bit now about the uh, timelines. So you see initials, and that says 37 days, but that's coming down. Okay, so expect that to continue to trend downward. You see the PR timelines are continuing to be long. A lot of that's because we are not prioritizing those PRs because you don't lose your eligibility. We are prioritizing those derogatory PRs, uh, but a PR does not keep you from going to work as you retain your eligibility. We'll catch up on that as we move on down the road and get this uh, initial workload out of the way. So with that, um, I'm going to stop talking here. I think we're about the end of our time, but I think it's time to see if there's any questions for anybody from the DVD, whether it be Ms. Stokes, Ms. Green, or myself. Bob Lilge, Industry. I, I, I don't know whether this is question would be for you or whether it would be for Mr. Bradley. We've heard a lot today about reciprocity. We have the seed from last year, I think it was, about reciprocity. I've seen no statistics on reciprocity, timelines, timeliness of reciprocity. Is it meeting the requirements of the seed, et cetera? So, I'm, I'm throwing out the question, are we going to see that in the future? Can somebody report on that today, what reciprocity guy, uh, timeliness is looking like? Uh, is, 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 is four months norm? Is it one month norm? Is it 
two weeks norm, what, what it is, just so that industry has an idea of if, if this is something that's a concern, the, t the trend line is going up, down, staying steady, or whatever. It's a great question. Valerie, you want to talk about that on the SNAP? Uh, well, just from the DNI perspective, yes, the seed was signed in November, and we did remind agencies that they are to collect the information so they'd be able to report back to us, and we have reporting requirements that are captured by my colleague, Olga Delgado. So um, I'm not sure she has that information readily available today, but we are asking agencies to provide their information, and we're collecting it and reviewing it. And those reports are due out, and I'm not exactly sure of the time frame. But we are starting to collect and examine how agencies are um, in compliance. Yes, it does. Yeah, I'll, I'll say this. I mean, we, we will start tracking that for you. from State Department. I have four questions. Um, going from his question, um, I have a question I've brought up before about RRUs. There was a meeting last week online, a personnel security group, and I asked the question because, go figure, people that retire from State Department want to go work for companies that, and we don't have DOD clearances. And it's been a huge problem from my perspective because I get the calls trying to, you know, saying, can you help me, you know, because I'm getting another job. And, you know, and so at this, on the, on the phone call, someone from, from DVD said it takes two days. Now I think that two days is probably the very end when he gets it on his desk and then it's out the door. But I asked on that call, do you have any stats of when someone submits, when a company submits a request, and when it actually get an answer? And nobody had the answer on the call. So I would ask that maybe that kind of goes with his thing, is how is that really working? Because it doesn't seem to be working with as many calls as I'm getting, and how long it's taking months you know, when some you know, companies submit a request for an RRU or what the new term is, I forget what the new term is, until uh, they get something. So yeah. that would be one question. Heather, do you have, would you like to respond or no? So, I think So we, we are going to continue, we'll work directly with, um, with ISU and the CAF and, and all parties to make sure that we have those timelines um, uh, thoroughly reviewed and then make sure that we have that process. Yeah, uh, I would agree with that. The, the, the fact that a RRU's process in two days doesn't mean the case is adjudicatively ready. That we may need to go out and get files from a different department. Uh, if it's reciprocity, there might be a deviation or some other issue in there. And so historically, and I'm not going to get ahead of Olga's uh, metrics on this, but historically, if, a, if a, when it got to the cap, if the case did, in, 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 it was in, in the house and, the, and we didn't have a problem getting that file and, the, and it did not have an issue or a deviation or a waiver in there, they're, they're adjudicated pretty quickly. It's those ones where we have to go out and get the files that go on and on and take, and take much more time. Uh, I look forward to seeing our corporate uh, reciprocity metrics uh, in, the, in the near term here as we try to uh, make sure our systems can report in accordance with the seed and, and everything else and we find that new normal in order to support that requirement. Our entire business process review. As we stand up the, the VROC and we inherit um, the National Background Investigation you know, Bureau and we have new capabilities that are coming out, we want to get as lean as we possibly can and as automated as we possibly can. So I think it's not going to happen overnight, but I think there will be a shift in our business operations, which would affect your timelines on questions just like that, ma'am, in the future. Question number two, this. I brought it up at two NISPAC meetings. I brought it up a couple weeks ago on the phone. Uh, my question is, everybody's concerned about what company is getting onto this and how many are on there and how many are not. And no one seems to be concerned at all that 
I, as a non-DOD agency, DOD user agency and others, have not been talked to anything with regard to a timeline as to when I might be able to. It's been nine years or so since I started on the JPAS thing, which I, which I thought this was coming, so I kind of pulled back, but now I have to bring it up again. Um, I feel like the, the NISPAC is not just about contractors, it's about government agencies as well, and I don't feel like anyone is listening with regard to that access. Okay, so I'll, I'll take this one in, unless you want to. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so I, I, we hear you loud and clear. So that office that I showed you, the EBSO, the Enterprise Business Support Office, that office is set up specifically for strategic engagements with all of our customers, Department of State being one of them. We, Terry Carpenter inherited um, in, from a PEO perspective um, two years of, of, I would say, you know, uh, work from previous PEOs as he was required to build the NBIS. As he got in there and really looked under the hood, found major the system architecture issues that he's wanted to make. So we, we want to roll out this and all capabilities to all customers tomorrow. Okay. Focused his, his time and effort in the past eight months to a year on really getting the architecture right to maximize us as we roll out new capability. And he will be also responsible for the system of systems to include. And so my commitment to you, please give me your card before you leave here so that I can have my team, my EBSO team, come and sit down with you and get your requirements and lay out a roadmap that is satisfactory for you in the future with the capabilities that we have to be able to offer. Thank you. Not gotcha. a lot. If, if I could just add on to that, is one of the things that's happened in the last, I think it was <clears throat> six months, is that the functional management for the DISC and, and JPAS and those systems has shifted from what used to sit at USDI down into the DVD. So Ms. Stokes is the required, has, has that functional management requirements piece. And then works and her team uh, work in the functional management piece. Uh, Nick Moore and I think we have Pat Hogan here today work closely with NBIS PEO to, to execute those requirements in, in the prioritized way. So I think that was a good move in, in getting it out of the USDI higher level OSD and getting it out of the down MDC? into the DVD. Out of the MDC then? I'm sorry? Out of the MDC? Yeah, so let me talk about That's that. That's a good move. But, yeah, for, for a second. So the, the OPCON memo that the Debt Sec Def signed out on the 20th January transferred three entities. Half operational control to Mr. Payne under DCFA, under the DVD, the PEO for NBIS out of DISA to operational control under Mr. Payne, and elements, elements of DMDC that specifically rate, relate to the systems for vetting, so this would be one of them, operational control under, under DCFA. What will become DCFA? That will be the new Or, or a part of NBIS PEO, right? Well, yeah, so at, at any rate, they're all under the operational control as that delegated, a lot of the work delegated down to DVD. And so that's going to be very, very, and it already has proven to be. We were working together, but now we are all working under the same roof for the same boss, same requirements, um, and, and so I think the efficiencies are, are tremendous. Number three. Because there's a couple other questions that came out of our clearance working group meeting that pertain to DISS. So the one had to do with the lack of training for DISS users. Another was kind of similar to the NIS question I asked earlier. Will there come a time and when is it that all it will be mandated DISS user, that you have a DS, DISS user account if you're a clear account? Yeah, so I will uh, certainly touch on the provisioning, I think is what you're, you're, you're getting at, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and we ask for everyone's help here uh, from an industry provisioning perspective. Um, right now we have 6,000, approximately 6,000 industry individuals provisioned, and we still have another three to 7,000 that, that need to be provisioned. And we have opened the gates. I mean, we, 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 we've opened up all provisioning. Um, you are welcome to submit any, any your PSAR, your system access request form, and all the required information, and we posted all that information on the DSS website. Um, we're getting to the point where you're right. We're going to need to have, you know, a, a timeline where you know, we're going to have to shut off certain functionality, hopefully to drive the provisioning to occur that needs to occur, so we can start moving into one system. 
Um, when we make that decision, when we, when we come up with that timeline, um, we have committed that we'll give you 90-day notice um, that, in fact, we're going to start off a specific functionality within the system so that hopefully we'll drive additional provisioning to come in. So I, I am asking for your help with that um, because we, we need to get everyone provisioned. We need to get everyone into this so that we can continue to move forward with our system enhancement. And on the issue of training? Yeah. So, go ahead. Um, so, so we have tasked CDSC to, to get some initial training, Greg, out. Um, but I will tell you, as, as I told you, that Mr. Carpenter has looked at the entire architecture, all right? Mm -hmm. All systems of systems. Um, I think there, have, there are opportunities for disimprovement. Um, I think the proper IT word is refactoring, I'm told. Um, and, uh, and so we want to be very careful. We want to make sure that we provide the training. We know when this was rolled out to the government side, it was not appropriate training. It, it was a perfect example of how to not to roll out a capability, which we took a lot of lessons learned from, that we will employ in the new capability out in Nimbus. Um, but um, so we, we've passed CDSE, um, but I think we, we need to get industry. Um, but I think you're going to see improvements in the future. I'll leave it. Yep, that, I would agree. I think we're going to start making some traction. Uh, but I think that, you know, the message also is don't wait for those improvements. It's important that we get folks on this as soon as possible. It's important that we get the training in place. It's important that we get those improvements. And I'll just add one more thing. Um, so the, obviously, once you get provisioned and you're in the system, the user manuals are, are in the system. So hopefully that, that's some help there. Uh, as well as we have a, a dish uh, short uh, that's available for. Right. So, so we have moved forward with some training uh, that is available on step that's available to you. We also have hosted a few webinars. Um, and obviously, we, we do all that we can do to get the information out. So there is some information available out there. So we just ask everyone to, to access it, um, look, and see if, if it's what you need. If it's not, then, then we're welcome to provide feedback so that we can share that with CDSE. All right, thank you. Okay, I'll drop number four so you don't get mad at me. I'll just ask for number three. With all the changes, y'all, I have no idea who does what anymore. I think the last time I was wondering, is there any way that there's an org chart, not just what you do, but who you call for what? Because right now, I've lost track of who does what at DSS headquarters context. So is there an org chart of some sort that can be provided? So um, I, I don't want to answer this, but at DSS sometimes we, we get, we're unclear right now. But it's, it's, it's I mean, <laughs> let's be honest with each other. Uh, you know, I don't want to go on record saying that, but the bottom line is we are in the midst of, and I just did, um, so Heather Green, uh, and anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> in all seriousness, if, if I could be really transparent and honest um, and humble, um, if you look at the transitions that DSS is going through right now with um, the executive order, with uh, the transitions of the OPCON memo oh, just, uh, that we just talked about, and those big organizations that are coming in, and then what the executive order will do, we have to get 10,000 or 9,000, Mark, how many people does NBIB? Uh, 11,000 ish people into the DCSA, which, which, that's our new name, Defense Counterintelligence Security Agency, um, when the executive order is signed, um, at, into, into DFS. Um, we, we stood up with DVD. We are integrating with the PEO. They're, we're, we're, we're reestablishing ourselves completely so for business efficiency. So we serve our customer base. So, so yes, it's change management is turmoil. That's the fact. And, um, and so um, it's, it's my EBSO from, from the betting directorate side of the house that, that we get you the information on so that you, can, you know who to call. Um, I can't, I'm not going to speak to the other parts of, of DCSA, but our DCSA org chart, our new org chart, is, is up get our secretary to approve it right now. So I understand your angst. And, and I feel it, we share it. Every DSS employee and every NBIB employee share it too. But I will commit to you that where we are going is the right thing for national security, it's the right thing to get after risk, and it's the right way we need to vet to a trusted workforce 2.0 future. 
And that's where we all have to, I have to beg your indulgence and your patience. It's very hard for our employees as well. So, so if I could, and, and this is fair, but the reason we highlighted the, the, the VROC and the CAP here is because that's, that's where the bulk of your questions are on the work. So, so by and large, and Heather checked me on this, is that you, you still have the same folks. So, so Heather and her team are still the PSMOI and execute those. Your requirements, she has Pat Hogan on her staff, so he can work those requirements up into the EBSO. And, those, and, and, and so, and when it comes to the CAF, you still have the same CAF call center and you still have the same process by which you're dealing with the CAF. It doesn't mean we're not going to move things further uh, and further integrate them in the future. And, and of course, NBIB is still with NBIB and you still have the same uh, call center or whatever. Now, do we have ideas in the future to merge these things and make it more better and improve the whole processes? Yes. But for the most part, although we have some work charts here that are new and, and functioning, Folks you're calling are the same ones. Is that correct, Heather? Well, we've got a NASA, um, my question was to follow on to Kim's about this. And our um, biggest concern is information sharing. And I wanted to know what is the timeline for you all to start addressing our agencies collectively? that immediate or one to two years out or what is it, you know? So I'll take a whack at that. First of all, there's, there's, you know, there's a lot of requirements out there. There's your requirements, there's CAP requirements, there's uh, component security manager, no depth requirements, and all of those are being addressed in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a manner of prioritization. Um, you know, the, it's, this isn't perfect for the adjudicators. We have, you know, many hundreds probably workarounds, but, but we had to get on with it because that was the system of adjudications, and, and that's kind of my point. If we wait for this to be perfect before we get onto this, we're, we're, we're day late and a dollar short. Uh, separately from that, as we go forward with MDIS, you're going to see pieces and parts of, of this deployed within the MDIS system. Um, and so, uh, if you're on this, you're going to be part of that graduation into MDIS. There will be no sunset. I don't think there will be a sunset day for this. It will just be become MDIS as they make the improvements. So, so is there a timeline, yeah, a hard timeline for your agency's that. requirements? I, I couldn't answer that. I think that would have to go into the requirements process to look at it. But I, I think we'll be making some good progress uh, for sure within the next. Okay, so that you don't have access to those systems. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm I'm going to take an action item to for my EBSO to hold a stakeholders group. And we've talked about this and I think that way we um, can get out of this forum and let you move on, um, but really get to the questions that you're asking with the right people there to take the actions and to make sure we have the share the right information with you. But but again, we are in the biggest change management I've ever seen. And Valerie, I think you can um, vetting enterprise. And so um, none of this is easy and we want to roll out things that are right and ready for our community. You roll things out that aren't right and ready, you have way more problems. Um, and so we will we will take an action and we'll get the appropriate list of stakeholders and, and we will we will hold on hold on. Yes, because you gave me feedback on Monday, right? So I, Monday night, I went right at it. So great, thank you. All right, I think I'm well over my time. Thank you very much. All questions? Did you get? Yeah. Monday, I mean, we will. Uh, I don't want to come back in June and have to hear the same thing. We still don't have access. So, so <laughs> keep us apprised, then. I think we can we can do to help you.
Thank you so much for that full conversation. All right, we're now going to hear from Valerie uh, Irvin about uh, seeds. Nothing really to update. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know our time is very short, but I mean, I was just going to say that I'm happy we're going to be hosting the Trusted Workforce Briefing for um, the NISPAC and ISU, and we look forward to continuing our conversation. Thank you. All right, we're going to move quickly into our working uh, group reports. Um, Paul Helmer from DSS about the uh, NISA working group. Thank you, Robert. Um, in an effort for time, just uh, uh, these are DSS items that uh, uh, we're engaged with the NISA working group on. Uh, first off is our uh, process manual that describes how we get through the assessment and authorization process of classified systems. And uh, it is scheduled to be released April 8th with an effective date of uh, May 6th. It's something that we worked out in the, uh, we've had a, a variety of feedback both internally and externally on, de on developing the, ne the next version of it. It includes the, the revisions that have been made in this, uh, instructions on our uh, transition to EMAS as our system of record, and something uh, that came out of the NISA working group was some, some language and some uh, streamlined processes for doing proposal systems. So that uh, will start, uh, be released on the uh, 8th of April, effective on uh, May 6th, so it gives uh, folks about a month to read and comprehend what's in the new process manual. Uh, transition to EMAS, again, we're scheduled for to transition to EMAS as our system of record beginning May the 6th. Uh, there are numerous job aids on our uh, uh, NISP RMF Resource Center link, uh, uh, under that link there's two tabs. One is for risk management framework implementation, and another is for EMAS. Uh, there's job aids as how to get sponsored to get access to the training, job aids for uh, getting you onto the training site and taking the training, job aids for doing account registration and all the forms needed. And then uh, we'll have some additional job aids on just some high level the high-level items that uh, things like account regi uh, system registration for within the uh, program. But uh, between now and then, uh, OBMS is our current system of record for assessment and authorizations. It will remain so. Uh, we will begin, uh, we will take this as a phased uh, transition. So uh, information in OBMS, will we will work those packages through. So uh, if you submit something on uh, April the 1st, or I mean on May the 1st, and we won't ask you to resubmit it into EMAS on May the 6th. We'll work it through OBMS, and then we have all, all the uh, packages worked within OBMS. We'll... Uh, the last one, and, and the bullet points are cut out, just to talk about uh, we're doing classified enterprise uh, wide area networks as a uh, national level initiative to try to bring uh, central monitoring and management along with uh, uh, continuous monitoring, vulnerability management, insider threat management uh, into the classified arena where we all, where I know a lot of uh, industry already has those items on their unclassified networks. We're trying to leverage those best practices within the uh, classified arena now. And we see that uh, this will be a uh, huge uh, impact on resources for both industry and DSS. It will save us time because we'll, use, we'll finally start using technology, vice using manpower to, to do auditing and to uh, look at uh, the security controls. So uh, we started down that road. We have a, a few companies that uh, have their initial uh, classified wide area networks uh, authorized, and uh, we have probably another uh, eight to 10 companies that are in the process of putting information together. Um, I won't go through all. I won't go through the metrics. I know this is part of the packet that you, you all can receive, but uh, just uh, these are we, we track our metrics uh, via region, so we can identify, and then down to the field office location, so we can identify where we might have potential gaps. Uh, currently, we are leveraging uh, folks from the capital region into the northern region to work a, a bubble that we've had there for a few uh, a few months, and we, we continue to. Uh, monitor this as far as what we have for workloads, what we have for impacts, 
and uh, how we can continue to uh, manage uh, the assessment and authorization process. Uh, pending any questions, Mr. Chairman, I will. I am done. Anybody have anything for Carl? I have two questions. Oh, go ahead. You go, Dennis. Uh, uh, actually, I, I don't. Uh, I would say that from from the, the standpoint of the uh, the Western region, aside from expiring things that are coming due, in the, and we're we're looking at that currently, we uh, the Western region workload we're pretty current on that. So, but part of that, looking at what's coming out in the next 90 days, and I will tell you, we look at the next 180 days in, in next year is that we are, you know, so we are looking at that future state. What would we, you know? But until those, those are ones that are defined in the system that are set to expire, they may not actually turn into submissions. So uh, we're, so we, but we, so we manage that on a routine basis by looking at what's currently coming in. So good question, thank you. So um, sticking with that chart, um, the uh, cap you mentioned Northern is coming down to help capital, but... No, uh, the other way around. Oh, the other way around. Okay, yeah. but either way, capital has 100, or mine says 101, that's just 93 denied. Still far and above all the other, the other three regions, and even making it more significant, they don't have, in fact, they have the least number of submissions. So do you, do you know what the factors are that are contributing to why the one region has a significantly higher number of SBP denials? Sure. Um, capital region has the largest percentage of very small contractor, you know, cleared contractors. And I'm talking less than 10 people, 20. They just do not have the cybersecurity skills to submit a package. So um, to, be, to be bluntly honest, if a package is submitted and it's just wholly inappropriate, it just doesn't, it just doesn't cover it. anything Got within it. the risk management framework, we just deny the package out and, tell, and send, give them some locations to go and get some training. So that's what a security consultant. That's right. exactly right. Uh, I think everyone sees the business. Second question. Um, <laughs> on the first chart, um, I understand there's a pilot going on as it relates to uh, – maybe you're not ready to, to give any updates on that. I thought it was started in December. Is that, is that true? So, um, there's a small number of uh, contractors, companies, uh, so if there's any updates. It's okay, simply. so uh, we have not started the pilot. Uh, we we uh, uh, The EMAS application is uh, uh, owned and managed and uh, supported by DISA. Um, this asked us to delay a little bit, which is why one of the reasons we've moved, we pushed the uh, the implementation yeah. into May, uh, is this moves their servers to the cloud. So uh, we haven't started that yet. We have we have a, a variety of local companies that we're going to do that with. A uh, couple of a uh, couple of our NISPAC, NIS, the NISA working group members are on that, and so we'll be getting feedback for that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, one quick question. Uh, on the ELAM, Mr. Carl, uh, was, can you give a little color around that as to uh, where that is? Is it ideation? Is it, you know, or the sort of so, plan is there? So we are we are uh, finishing up uh, a couple of different items. So one is kind of a one pager that we're going to send out internally to, to, to government folks, uh, just kind of describing what it is and it, things that they might need to talk, you know, to talk with their acquisition folks and their program managers about with it. And then two is an external uh, document that, it, that gives, you, gives uh, industry some checkpoints to see, do, would we, is this something that would work for us? Uh, it is really geared toward larger multi-facility companies. Uh, we do have, currently we have uh, two companies that uh, have approved enterprise level classified WANs. Uh, one, one company has about 65 locations that are under the corp, their WAN, and the other company has, I think, seven or eight, and they're planning migration for upwards of 70 of them. Uh, we have another one that we're just waiting on some, uh, some certification information from NSA before we start them. 
and just to kind of give you an idea of the scope of it. So, we're, so we've started down the road, and we're just we're we're working, we're engaging individually with with the uh, facilities. But to just give you an idea of where we're looking at the future, uh, one of our companies has currently they have 500 over 550 uh, eight authorized systems under ATOs. Uh, their their four year goal is to put 400 of those authorized systems into their classified WAN. So we'll reduce number will reduce the amount of local oversight both at the industry locations and at the DSS locations required to manage that by centralizing that both within DSS will we'll manage this now and at the facility because they'll have a couple of network operations centers and they'll be able to continuously monitor, patch, manage inside a threat program. We'll actually uh, decrease the number of human assets we need and increase the technology behind uh, good cyber security. Thank you. All right. If not, we're going to turn to Greg Pernodi on the uh, Security Clearance Working Group. Okay. So um, most of what I would cover has already been discussed um, in updates given by DOD, ODNI, uh, the NISS update. Um, so I just want to maybe impress upon a couple of things. Um, and we've heard a lot about transparency, a lot about communication, and that, that's a big, the clearance working group is sort of a catch-all for all the other things that go on. At one point, I also want to make sure uh, you hear, we're planning a follow-up to that resolution group, because we still have steps, we have things to resolve. Uh, the week, the first week of April, we're going to probably try to shoot for April 4th, so we'll, we'll send something out to let you know. But in the way of communication, here's one example that uh, was brought to my attention um, after the uh, working group meeting, the clearance. And it may seem simple, but it, it really just goes back to making sure that we are utilizing, leveraging the NISPAC, in this case, industry, um, on communications. Um, as I understand it, which is a great thing, the voice of uh, industry letter memo that DSS does periodically, uh, it goes to all the facility security officers and or the KM, the key management persons. So it's, you know, 12,000, 13,000 companies, but sometimes these eight NISPAC industry members aren't among those uh, two sets of individuals. Um, if you, the ask is just simply include the industry spokesperson on just about any and all communications that are meant to go widespread. This way, uh, Clinton representing all of the NISPAC industry you know, simultaneously informed of what's going on. Whether or not the task is for him directly or the eight NISPAC members, that is the focus. That's, the, that's really why we have a NISPAC and the formal process of uh, industry engagement should really go through them. And I'm willing to debate that with anyone. But uh, So that's more of an ask. The other couple things just to highlight, uh, I think on one of the slides Ned was showing, um, use of e-adjudication. Um, it, it appears, from what I've seen, we really need to step that up. And I know there's plans to do that. But in the case of industry, numbers I'm hearing is only 1% to 2% of industry initials. Common sense would say that is that number. There's something in that business process that is too difficult. There's some something there that we're not taking enough of a risk management approach. Um, and, you know, if we're trying to do things as efficiently as possible, that's an area that I think is right uh, to, to take a look at. Most of the people get through the clearance process. There are some that have issues, but a lot don't have issues. So it's, it's puzzling to me why so many uh, don't make it through the adjudication process, other than right now the business rules are rather strict. At least that's the way it looks. Um, and we kind of touched on this, but also coming after the uh, clearance working group, this, uh, the business about the NIDs, the national interest determinations, it's, it's still, even though it affects small numbers of contractors, it's still an item of concern. Um, and I will say, particularly among just a couple of CSAs without mentioning any names. So what we want to do, as this group sometimes does effectively, I think, is collect numbers. We're not revealing any classified information, folks. We just want to collect numbers and timelines for how long it takes to process NIDs. Now, that would identify each uh, 
owner in the prescribed information. I want to put that out there. So uh, that that's all I'm going to say. I, yeah, Olga's been patient, and uh, she's up next. So unless there's questions. Uh, just a part, and this is Mark Brooks with DOE. Um, with respect to NIDS and, and the proposal to collect metrics on that, uh, we support the transparency as a CSA. The only thing, and I heard this initially, and, I, and due to time I wasn't going to interject um, when our industry colleague Quentin raised it, um, we've never heard where there's a specific issue to the Cognizant Security Agency or the Cognizant Security Office. And with respect to that, um, it seemed like we're trying to get data to validate a problem, but we haven't done the appropriate analytical work to see if an issue actually exists. So to my point, once we get that data, if industry could provide that to ISU to say, hey, we submitted these NIDs and they exceeded the timelines as prescribed in 32, 32 CFR 2004, then that provides a basis. But I just, just want to make sure that there's actually an issue that's been validated versus an, an assertion. Thank you. So, I may. so uh, this is Jeff Spinninger. Um, so I, um, first, Craig, I, I really appreciate you um, speaking up on it and, uh, and, and, uh, and Quentin as well. Uh, I actually think um, it's, it's a much bigger issue than we actually think it is. Uh, so there's a small number of companies that are under SSA, uh, but there are a ton of those companies who are either prime or subcontractors. And so, so while we see the top level of this thing pretty regularly and we hear from those companies when it's the prime piece, we don't hear about it nearly as often uh, when it's the subcontracting. So, so I, I think, uh, you know, the working group construct to build a, uh, a mechanism, uh, you know, th this is what this, uh, this uh, forum is, is, uh, is built for. Um, at the same time, we didn't mention it earlier, but um, so the, for those of your students of all, all this stuff, uh, uh, Section 842 uh, last year, we're, we're rolling through the process as fast as we can, uh, frankly, uh, to address what uh, Congress has uh, given us permission to, uh, which is to implement uh, the provisions in 842 in advance of the one October 2020 date. Uh, that is a wonderful mechanism by which we will have metrics and, uh, and we will definitely um, our, our uh, counterparts in the services and SAPCO in particularly where, where most of our, uh, where much of uh, the departments prescribed uh, gets, um, where this, where this uh, is kind of in, in center stage, uh, are, are helped us through the, uh, the coordination process. Um, now it's over to the lawyers and then it'll roll out. But, uh, but I will definitely be looking forward to bringing this back. And, and uh, just like we've done before, a, a work group uh, in, this, in this forum, I think, will help get us where we need to go. I, I think if I may, um, Greg, that's excellent, Jeff. And just while I was sitting here, I actually sent a note to my uh, FOCI SSA NID counterpart in the department to ask for those specific informations in support of DOD's efforts to implement Section 844 to F FY 1988. But I think that goes to the issue that my State Department colleague raised is that in terms of a government-wide approach, whether it's clearances, facility clearances, NIDs, SSAs, there needs to be a singular government repository that we have access to that we can grab that data because we have to move away from a working group to do enduring work. So Jeff, uh, I appreciate that DOD is going to look to that, but I think uh, based on the response we got from uh, Ms. Stokes and Ms. Heather, I think there's a greater national industrial security system uh, uh, capability across the whole of government that we need to be able to latch into and get this information instead of do independent data calls. So we'll work that through this, uh, this forum. Thank you. So Mark, I appreciate what you're saying. And you know, we're not going to solve it right here today. And certainly the idea that you just mentioned that a database would in the long run prove very helpful that put together. Uh, but in the short term, um, from what I've seen in the years I've been involved in this, whether it be clearance numbers, uh, information system uh, data, when we start to track and highlight it, that tends to put some focus on it. Uh, perhaps there isn't an issue. I'd be very surprised in terms of timeliness. Um, but we, we, we don't have data to support it either way, and it seems like it should not be that difficult to collect this data. So um, I, I, I do think it's worthwhile for us to do it uh, for our, as Jeff pointed out, cascading down subcontractors, subcontractors that are impacted by this as
and that was, and just to close out, I know we ran over, but, and, and that was kind of DOE's uh, retort um, leading up to the industry's issues meeting, is that in order to get really traction and bring these longstanding languishing, languishing issues to a close, that identify the cognizant security agency or the cognizant security office that's causing the issue, propose a resolution, and that's the metric that we could track as a forum, and that's the value proposition. So again, good number. We got 17 SSAs, 17 NIDs, that's on hold. Where's the holdup? Where's the breakdown in the process? So that way we could, we could determine rightfully as CSAs and CSOs, is it at the policy level, whether it's national level or CSA implementation, or is it somewhere downstream? That'll be helpful, and I, and I think to close out, Greg, Jeff has pledged to bring um, DOD's information as they seek to implement the provisions of Section 842, 842 and that's going to give us a data point if there's a much larger cast. But I think DOD has the preponderance, and I think the information they provide is going to yield us the information we need to go forward smartly. Thank you. To me, it's outrageous it takes that long for, for a company to wait that long, but, you know, that's why I'm personal. All right. Uh, we have yeah, wait for another one more. Some stats from... Uh, no, we've got yeah, the, the, uh, the, the metrics. Yeah. Okay. Um, last but not least, uh, latest personal security clearance performance metrics. Olga Delgado, ODNI. And also Perry. Yeah, and, and Perry up there. It's, Thank you so much. I know in the interest of time, I know we're a little bit over. Um, so we'll jump right into this. Uh, what is unique about this slide deck is you've heard from various departments and agencies today about their statistics in terms of timeliness. And so um, these slides actually do uh, depict the data that has been collected from not only DOD, OPM, um, and the IC, but a further breakdown of that, and this is unique for contractor data, uh, and it includes agencies' contributions from CIA, DIA, FBI, NGA, NRO, and NSA and State Department. I believe we've captured most of the departments and agencies that are still in the room. Snapshot of methodology, most of you are familiar with that. And we're currently using the PAC and SEC EA 2012 methodology here on the bottom. This slide represents um, industrial personnel security uh, timeliness metrics as it relates to uh, quarters. So if you take a look at this slide, we're comparing um, each of the investigative types, secret, confidential, top secret, and periodic investigations. And we're looking at the green bar, so on the chart, um, across the board, and the purple uh, block. So in comparison to those two items, um, we did see a slight increase in secret and confidential um, processing totaling within the number of days and also a decrease as well in periodic This is a snapshot for secret clearances for FY19 quarter one. So a little cutoff here on the slide deck on the bottom. Um, but if you take a look at this, it's 227 days in total. Uh, for this uh, secret process at this point in time. And that is a seven-day increase from last quarter. Top secret clearances, that includes the legacy uh, types as well as the, which is the SSCI and the Tier 5 investigations. We saw an increase here, so 423 days in totality, which is an increase of 31 days from last quarter. Periodic investigation, you'll also see here 331 days, we did have a slight decrease in numbers. For all questions, please give us, uh, send us an email and I'll open up the floor for any questions. Um, the decrease in PRs is attributed to modifications in our processing as it relates to ways in which we can find efficiencies in processes. So to um, relate to that, you saw some of the statistics from DOD. So Heather Green and I um, have been working closely together as well as um, uh, Director Phelan's staff as well over at MBIV to really drive down um, some of those um, 
processes, so the timeliness associated with those, those processes. Any other questions? Um, so uh, the partial government shutdown definitely did impact some of those numbers. I don't know if you were here previously for third quarter, but we actually had to caveat our numbers. So um, the department and agencies were not able to report their timeliness metrics uh, back in, um, what was it, uh, quarter four um, of 18. And so we had to give those folks time to get back into the office, reprioritize their work, and then we were able to process or a list of agencies you can look online. I didn't bring them all with me, but also that included some of the subcomponents of those major organizations. Any other questions? Yes. Hi, right, Carrie, you're up. Good afternoon. Uh, recognizing that we are already over time, I will be, I will strive to be very brief. Uh, uh, the Defense Office of Hearings and Appeals, as most of you know, is the uh, due process authority that um, is the only authority for denials and revocations for not only DOD contractors, but contractors with the 30 other federal departments and agencies under the NISP, uh, exception of the intelligence community agencies, Department of Energy, NRC, and a handful of others, we are the place where clearances get denied or revoked. The good news is that we do not have a backlog. Um, in fact, our, uh, our workload is at steady state at all of the stages um, where we work right now. Um, the, uh, we get our cases exclusively from the DOD CAF. Uh, we have worked closely with the DOD CAF to ensure that um, that, that that works smoothly. We're getting right now, uh, we have on hand um, a small number of the uh, state, statements of reasons. It's actually uh, 239 uh, active statements of reasons. Uh, we have a, approximately, uh, no, actually exactly uh, 472 cases pending hearing, uh, 340 cases pending administrative judge decision. Those are all within normal limits. Um, the, uh, the, the other good news is that uh, we believe that in the coming year, two of the things, we, we've talked about investigative standards and, and uh, uh, adjudicative standards, but probably the two biggest innovations that affect the workload that, uh, that we share with the CAF um, is uh, continuous evaluation, which can in theory increase the workload, but if it's managed correctly, it just helps us find the needles in the haystack without making the haystack bigger. Uh, that is at least our, our earnest hope. Um, the other thing is uh, I want to answer quickly a question that, that Greg asked, uh, which was, um, you may have mentioned rhetorically, but the, the, the concern about um, e-adjudication is real. Uh, one of the reasons that e-adjudication has historically not worked as well for industry as it does for the military departments, and, and historically the numbers for the military departments are significantly higher than they are for industry, it's because the industry applicants are older. They have been around longer. There are just more facts in their cases, and as a result, they don't pass the current adjudication business rule. Ned alluded to the fact that those rules are, are being retooled, and with luck, probably the best thing that we can do in the coming year for the DOD CAF uh, is to um, come up with more robust adjudication business rules that allow more cases to pass. And as suggested, uh, when in a world where we have historically, and this is a 30-year number, only denied or revoked approximately 1.5% of the cases, that means that there sh we should be able to do much better than we are currently doing with the adjudication. Um, those are the, the, the two big heavy lifts for the, the coming year. Uh, but as of right now, uh, Doha is, is healthy and uh, looking forward to continuing to work with the CAF and, uh, and DVD. Go ahead. Thank you. Again, will be July 18th here at the National Archives in this room, and then uh, also on November 20th, barring another government. 
Hope to see you all then. Okay, uh, meeting adjourned. Okay. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using AT&T Event Conferencing Enhanced. You may now disconnect.